it going? Okay. Hello and welcome to direct sunlight. Unfortunately, I got sensitive eyes and the sun is right there. So I've got to put these on for now. And that's because I am in New York. No, I'm in, <laughs> I'm in Las Vegas where there's something really wrong with this bridge. <laughs> it, it stops halfway through. And today I'm going to take you on a field trip to show you all about it. But also accompany, accompanying this uh, now half of a flyover, high speed flyover. See all these cones down below here? Take a close look at which way the traffic is going. As long as I set this live stream up correctly and it's not mirrored for some reason, everybody's driving on the left. This is a diverging diamond interchange, like the one I talked about in my videos, but it's made out of barrels. So I wanted to show, it was, it was too cool not to show off, so I thought I'd uh, show it off. Okay, so let's look here. Let me just to prove I am live. Oh my gosh, there's a lot of comments. Hello, hello, hello. I love your vids. Oh, this is live. Hey, Rob, I figured I'd jump in and say hi. Oh, that's my friend, Brandon. Hey, <laughs> how are you doing? Traffic cones. So, but, but um, since you're here first, you want to see something uh, something cool I got in the mail? I, I, I got to show you this. Here, hold on. I, I'm not showing this to brag. Well, I'm showing it to brag. But it's also uh, because you helped me get this in the mail. So I figured I, I ought to share it with you. I got a, a box. And in that box is a letter where she says, hey, do you remember your 100th subscriber? No. Your 1,000th subscriber? No. <laughs> of course you do. And we know you'll definitely remember your 100,000th subscriber. Is I supposed to write that down? Anyway, they sent me a very nice uh, thingy here. Make sure it doesn't blow away. And I have not even pulled it out of its wrapper yet. So you guys get to be the first. I have peeked at it, but I didn't. Still in its plastic. So let's open it up. All right. Hey, you can see yourself. You're looking pretty good today. You know, just to be honest. So presented to us, the Road Guy Rob community, for 100,000 of us. So anyway, I thought it was pretty neat. I risked it getting stolen by bringing it with me here to walk around the Las Vegas Strip. But why not? I wanted to show you. So, okay, I let's see. The most Road Guy Rob location for a play button unboxing. Yeah, yeah, right next to Interstate 15. Now, this project here is interesting because why would you tear down a perfectly good uh, flyover? It's not in bad shape. The, 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 uh, the paint's a little bit cracked, but that's just, you know, paint. That has nothing to do with uh, the, the bridge itself. And I thought, well, it's Nevada. Of course, the main reason they tear it down is they're going to widen Interstate 15, and uh, they're not. This is not to widen the freeway. They're spending $300 million on this project, and it's not to add more general purpose lanes through. The, the freeway's already plenty wide. So I thought, well, that's interesting. $300, $300 million. Oh, we got a super chat here from... Uh, Moira Prime for two dollars. My opinion on OpenStreetMap. I had a college class where I. You're going to distract me. You guys are going to distract me this time. We're never going to get through this. <laughs> I had a college class where our senior, well, not senior project, but the term project was to go to our hometown and OpenStreetMap and kind of make a little changes to make it line up nicer. It's really, it's really a cool tool for people who can't afford the the Google Maps to add them to their website and stuff. It's, it's the Wikipedia of Maps. If you're not familiar with OpenStreetMaps, check it out. It's, I think it's a .org, OpenStreetMaps.org. It's fun because it's crowdsourced. So, oh, I also have something else to show you. Some fan art. <laughs> yeah, I even have the squint because it's a... Uh, it's sunny. 
I should have worn I should have worn the other hat. This is from somebody on Reddit in Rod We Trust 74. And I asked, can I share this? Because this is really cool. It looks looks just like me. And uh, they said, sure, as long as I include the watermark. And the watermark says, uh, include the watermark, fart control with a K. So anyway, yes, we will take a closer look at those traffic cones. I just want to show you some of this from up here first. I'm going to flip the camera around and I will do a, a zoom in. Thank you, by the way, to this hotel here who is not sponsoring it or anything. They, I just asked, hey, can I be on your parking garage so we can actually see this thing? And they said, yeah, sure. So that was really cool then. So this is Tropicana Avenue. And back in the 1960s, uh, they, when I-15 first started going around Las Vegas, they, uh, they looked, let's see if you can see it, kind of like this. There's just nothing there. You can see, you know, that's the, there's an old casino that was like before the stratosphere. I forget what it's called, but I think at the end of the movie Con Air, they crash into it and blow it up or something like that. But I mean, it was just a rural interchange in the middle of nowhere. Oh, my mic dropped out. Shoot. Can you guys hear me? Let's see, where did... Can you guys hear? Okay, good. All right. So it's grown up a little bit. This is the last, uh, um, the last uh, big, uh, this is the last of the old interchanges before they've gone in and really just completely redone the freeway down there. Oh, sorry for the low resolution because it's my phone, but all the other freeway interchanges nearby have been rebuilt since then. And in fact, to make this one last longer, somewhere around 1990, they added this gigantic flyover to handle all the left turning traffic that heads over to Las Vegas Boulevard to the Strip. Because again, even as recently as 1990, this picture's from the 60s, but it was a golf course where all of this is, where the T-Mobile Arena is, and that's where the, I think the Golden Knights play, the NHL team. Did they put a crosswalk on the on-ramp? Um, yes. So if you look down here, um, they have demolished half of the Tropicana uh, bridge because they have to replace it. And we'll talk about that in a minute, why this old bridge down here is going away. Besides the fact that it was built in the 60s, it's Las Vegas. You know, concrete stuff lasts a long time, so it wasn't like it was rusting out like a steel bridge would in, you know, Michigan or someplace where it really has to bear the brunt of the weather. Camera stopped working. Video stopped working. Oh, shoot. <laughs> I don't know. what is it, is it back now? Because it looks fine for me. Traffic cone's not working. Oh, come on. <laughs> All right. So I guess that looking at this, what were some of the problems with this old interchange that they're wanting to uh, fix? I guess we can go. Uh, let's go for a walk and uh, check it out. And I will uh, put my backpack on so I don't leave the uh, leave the plaque behind because that would be really sad. Start a second channel so you guys could help me I get another one, right? Okay. So there is, in fact, while we're up here, let me show you real quick. There is a street that parallels the freeway. Because freeways, you, you can't have cars on the freeway directly connect to the businesses next to them. This is not safe. It, would, it wouldn't be a freeway anymore. So you have frontage roads that are on the outside. This one's called Dean Martin Drive. You can see it just on the left-hand side of these southbound lanes of the 15 freeway. And Dean Martin Drive, of course, is named after Dean Martin. And then when Dean Martin Drive gets close to the uh, main interchange here with Tropicana, well, you wouldn't want Dean Martin Drive coming straight through. You'd have a stoplight right here for Dean Martin Drive, right next to this uh, southbound off-ramp and, of course, where the 
looking here where the uh, south, southbound, oh, sorry, southbound on-ramp and where the southbound off-ramp used to be, where the, all that construction equipment is. So imagine you'd have your, for your diamond interchange here, a stoplight here, and then you'd have a stoplight right here for Dean Martin Drive. That would just be a safety and a traffic nightmare. So, yeah, well, you can do light timing, but there's only so much you can do. Because if you think about this diamond interchange, how many types of green lights, how many uh, phases of the cycle do you need? Well, you'd need a green light for people turning left. Well, I guess you wouldn't because you had this flyover. But uh, you would have uh, a, a light for people turning this way and then a light for people going straight both ways. But then over here, you'd have to have another one for people making lefts coming off Dean Martin like this, and another one for people going straight, and then some for people making a left and then a sudden right. And so pretty soon you'd have like eight phases. So you miss your green light, you gotta wait for seven phases before it's your turn again. So what uh, they did way back when, before in it, the gigantic In-N-Out burger was there, is they swung Dean Martin Drive around, and it goes all the way around this hotel property, and there's a stoplight with Tropicana just behind this hotel. We'll go look at it here in just a second. But even with it swung that far over from the interchange, the traffic really backs up in a bad way, especially back when this interchange was open. You'd have, you know, say I'm coming to this hotel and this had been open, I would have exited the freeway here, made a right-hand turn, come over to the light, and made a left. Seeing a few people asking where we're at, well, look at that skyline, we're in the Big Apple. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> we're in Las Vegas, and we're just west of the I-15 freeway, Interstate 15, at Tropicana, where um, they're spending $300 million to uh, shorten this bridge so it doesn't go all the way. No, I'm just kidding. No, it's, it's a project to uh, fix this interchange, get rid of an old 1960s bridge that has some problems, and to address this issue we're talking about here of this frontage road. Now in Texas, they would do those one-way frontage roads um, where they the ramp, because it's all the traffic's coming towards us, the ramp coming off the freeway is coming towards us, so they could just kind of merge together, go through a single light, and then when you get on this side, uh, it splits back apart with traffic going back on the freeway and the frontage road continues. Because this is out on the west coast, the frontage road is a two-way street. Sometimes there's good reason for that. You know, if you're down there, at one, say you're at the In-N-Out Burger and you want to go back to your hotel, you don't have to go all the way around a mile on the wrong side of the freeway and then turn around and make two U-turns. You can just make a left and get there. The downside is you can't have your frontage road like it does in Texas meet here. It's too unsafe, so they swing it way out here. And the goal of this project is to say, you know what? This thing is a traffic jam nightmare because already you have a failing interchange of everybody trying to get on and off this freeway. But even if they successfully get off the freeway, they come down to this other stoplight and they get all jammed up. So why don't we go take a look at that? I'll uh, flip the camera around, read a few of your chats. I gotta lower this thing, otherwise uh, you just see the top of my head. There we go. Well, how long has Blue Man Group been in Las Vegas? Never seen it. I just that sign I think's been up there since the '90s. Anyway, okay. So I've got to walk. And the hard part about walking is it's not as fast as driving, but it's okay. Walking's a good thing. And I can't read any of your texts because the sun is, hopefully I get to the stairwell here. I can. One thing we'll talk about when we get over to the bridge is back when they started building the interstate highways, they had to try to figure out, Rob the parking lot guy. <laughs> oh, Spitze, Deutschland, the gates. Okay, um, back when they were building the interstate system, they had to balance the needs of, you know, affording to build, you know, thousands, tens of thousands of bridges all over the country um, with the height clearances high, high enough that 
you know, the, the military in a war had to use the interstate system. They wanted bridges where they could get a 17-foot truck underneath the bridge. And uh, the uh, local state said, oh, we only want 14 feet because uh, you know, 17 is a lot of money. That's a very tall bridge. And you have to have longer, you know, run-ups of the dirt on both sides to, to get over. And uh, they settled on 16 feet. The only problem was there were already a lot of bridges that had been built with a 14-foot standard, so they were less than 16 feet. So I looked at this bridge because part of why they're replacing it is it's too short. And <laughs> this bridge is 15 foot 10 inches. <laughs> it is two inches underneath the standard. And I thought, well, that's not a big deal. Why, why would you replace a, a whole bridge for two inches? And I, I guess it isn't a huge deal because um, this bridge has survived all the way since 1966. I looked up when they built it, and it's 1966, so that's almost 60 years, 55 years, something like that. But they still have... Uh, Oh no, sorry. It, 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 they wanted, the military wanted 17 feet. They settled on 16 feet. So, you know, still tall enough to be too expensive for states to pay for, but uh, a foot too short for the military. So I need to catch up on the super chat people. You earned some in and out from John, Bo Bon John Bo, Bo ah, come back. Bon John Bovey, 220. That's the price of a fry. I'll get one after. I won't get one now because you know you guys don't want to wait. Okay, so this is this interchange here, or sorry, intersection, Dean Martin Drive. I'll flip your ca the camera around so you can see, Dean Martin Drive and um, Tropicana. So the interchange is just down here. We'll walk down there in just a second so you can check that out. But but that's some of the challenge you run into is that you have this huge intersection with. I don't know, um, six, you know, two through lanes in each direction, three through lanes in each direction on Tropicana. So that's two green phases you've got to deal with. Then you have the turning vehicles who are another phase. So you've got northbound, southbound turning, you know, so right now we got a phase of everybody going straight through. So that's one of them. We'll have the turning vehicles, which I think just happened, which is two. The same thing on Tropicana. So you have a long four phase signal and uh, that, can get to the point where the amount of space you need, because this street goes all the way out to those mountains and there's houses all the way out there. So if you have people backed up waiting for their turn at this long four phase interchange, well, you end up with uh, cars backing clear into the interchange itself. So the thought is, well, what if we just got rid of this intersection entirely? What, what if we were able to uh, instead, oh shoot, turn this around here. What, what if instead we could send it underneath this new bridge that we're building? So, so when NDOT replaces the Tropicana Bridge, they can send Dean Martin straight underneath. And then these roads can, can act almost kind of like a clover leaf in a way. I, I've got the drawing, I'll pull it up here. But, the, the thought is you have uh, you think about a clover leaf, how you have kind of a curly ramp that sends you the one way and on the other side of the bridge the curly ramp that goes the other. Well if Tropicana is now a bridge and it goes over, you can do that. There's the old design. There we go. So we are standing Okay, so we are standing here, and currently, here's the freeway, here's the Tropicana Bridge we're looking at, here's that flyover that abruptly chops off here. Instead of the, the existing road coming all the way up, sending all the through traffic through this light, which is so close to the interchange, and then coming back down, what if instead we could send everybody underneath the new bridge and then there's a stoplight on each side on Dean Martin Drive that comes up to here and that's a right turn only and a right turn in. So this stoplight goes away entirely. And the next stoplight's so far down that even if it did have a problem, it's not gonna back up half a mile, so it's fine. 
Mr. 504, thank you. Uh, 499 says, earlier, if you didn't miss it, there were five cars that were driving the wrong way on the DDI. No way. You're serious? As I, I somebody on um, Reddit tipped me off, and I, I'm trying to remember who it was, because I wasn't aware of this temporary DDI until somebody named Operation Butterfly posted it on uh, the Road Guy Rob subreddit, which you're welcome to hang out, talk roads with us if you want. But the Channel 3 caught this semi truck, in the, you know, late at night when they're doing their live shot for like the 11 o'clock news, came off, got confused. There wasn't anybody there to follow and did what he thought was the right thing, which was turn into the right hand side. And there he is going down the wrong side. But to see that in person, well, that's just, uh, that's just fantastic. <laughs> so let's go walk over to the DDI now and uh, take a look at it itself and we can watch it uh, in progress. This is a little bit of traffic history here because there's been plenty of DDIs. There's been short-lived DDIs that have been replaced, but this is the first time I've seen a genuinely temporary DDI. No, oh, I'm gonna get demonetized because I've got uh, Lil Wayne in it now. <laughs> Lil Wayne. I actually like that song. Let's notice the width of the sidewalk. I think it's probably about five feet. So it's not as horrible as like three foot sidewalks you sometimes see in areas where pedestrians were an afterthought. But it's not really a place you want to ride your bike. You got street poles right in the middle of the sidewalk. That's not good for somebody in a wheelchair. And so part of this project is since they have a clean slate with that bridge, they're going to add 10 foot, a 10 foot sidewalk in its place. And on the uh, northbound side of the street, uh, north side of the street, I guess that'd be the westbound side of the street, there was no sidewalk at all before. You just couldn't walk on that side of the street. Well, it'll have a 10 sidewalk now. So that's a nice change. Okay, so we're coming up here to the little splitter island that they've made out of these, you know, barrels. I don't know what do you call a square barrel, but... Um, and what the splitter island does is it allows people to uh, make a free right, as, at least as much as the traffic, you know, backing up here for the light will let them. And so they're, they're able to have that free right outside of the crossover. And then once you get to the crossover, then you have the free left on the inside of the crossover and then vice versa when you get back to the other side. I had wondered, because I knew I would be walking to show this to you, I was wondering how the uh, pedestrian situation was going to be if they just would literally have it where it would be impossible to walk. Um, credit to NDOT, they really are trying to make this walkable because I think even from 20 years ago there was a time when the strip had really been built out you had New York New York and the arena wasn't there yet but you definitely had uh, all the casinos over there but this side of the freeway was no man's land you know I think you had the in and out which everybody went to in a car and that was it it was all gas stations and industrial stuff and now you're starting to get a significant amount of development on this side of the freeway. I mean, look at down here at the next street at, at Harmon, you have a very large uh, condo tower, and a lot of those are gonna be people on vacation. They're gonna fly into McCarran, and it kind of seems a shame that somebody has to rent a car that's gonna sit in a parking garage at their you know condo tower here, and the only reason they have the car is to get out of McCarran to the condo and then from the condo to wherever it is they want to have entertainment, they park in another structure over here. I mean, it's just a lot of vehicle traffic that really could be um, something that you could accommodate with people walking around. Vegas has the density to be a, actually a pretty walkable place, but because every project was built one at a time, uh, it's a very car-dependent place, and they handle it well. It's not like it's a disaster, but 
thinking ahead, when you have an opportunity, you're, you're the Nevada Department of Transportation and you have an opportunity to replace this uh, overcrossing here, uh, make it a little wider. They're widening it anyway. They're going to add, get this, this, let me flip back around so I can show you. So this, um, uh, the, the cars that come this way and would normally have a normal left-hand turn to turn onto the freeway when the DDI is gone and it's well, the project's all finished. It traditionally, it, it had in the past been a two-lane left turn. They're going to change that to three. <laughs> so if you're spending the money to put in a triple left turn, which is fine, that's, that's great that they're doing that, why not put in that extra 20 feet for people to safely cross the street? It makes a heck of a lot of sense. And now, we're standing right over where the uh, Dean Martin Drive will come straight through. So that's Dean Martin Drive down there, like with the stoplight where we were at. Down this way, you can't really see it, is Dean Martin Drive that runs in front of that condo building. It'll run underneath the new bridge. We'd be underneath the new bridge here, and it'll keep going. And thinking about pedestrians again, they said, hey, why don't we put a staircase here? ADA people, yeah, they might still need to go down to the other street and do the gentle curve of the sidewalk. But for people who might be staying, say, at this hotel right here, right off of D. Martin Drive, they might be able to just walk right out to the sidewalk, up the stairs and beyond the bridge and beyond their way. It's okay to send a car kind of secure, uh, circuitously um, way out of the way uh, because you're driving, you're sitting down, gasoline, you know, whatever. But when you're walking, you really have to take a look at every single step somebody takes because if, if you end up uh, in a situation where you're, you're making somebody walk 20% more than they have to, well, I'm lazy, I'm a pedestrian. You make me walk 20, like a college campus, and they're like, well, we want the sidewalk to go like this and like this. I cut across the grass. Everybody does, because every single step is agony. And so you're trying to optimize something for pedestrians to make it useful by retrofitting what we have here. Putting that staircase in makes a heck of a lot of sense. So I, I really appreciate the thought they're putting into this, realizing there's a lot of tourists. Let's uh, take a break for a sec. Let's look at some of the uh, chat, because I have been so excited showing you this interchange. We haven't even really gotten into the DDI yet, but I want to look at my chats disappeared. I want to make sure I see them. Oh my, a lot of chats. Let's see. So we were talking about five cars that went the wrong way on the DDI. Yes, and I hope that uh, some of you saw it. I, I'll have to go back. I, I usually later make myself go back and watch this. It's weird to watch yourself. And uh, I'll keep an eye out to see if I can spot that. Let's see. Um, show some water drains. Actually, thanks for reminding me because they've got um, a big drainage thing down here. If we get time, or if you guys, hang, any of you want to hang out for too long, um, we can walk down that way and check it out because there's a big storm drain system because this is the kind of town that never gets rain until they get rain and then when they get rain the soil can't handle it so it all goes rushing on the surface it doesn't soak into the ground and so they have to have big channels and washes all over the place to push the water away so it doesn't pool and cause problems and flash floods and there's one of those big ones over there and it's right in the way of where dean martin drive is going to come straight through they get a jack cartilage uh for ten dollars and has a little is that telling me I need to dance? <laughs> but thank you very much. Let's see. Um, in and out Burger, how dare you remind me that I'm on the East Coast. They're making their way out there. I saw an article today where they are opening a Nashville, um, Nashville? Yeah, I think it was a Nashville um, hub. And Lindsay Snyder, who's the, the CEO, said something really cryptic because they were asking about, uh, you know, I've got relatives in Northwest Arkansas, and asking, uh, well, is In-N-Out coming to Northwest Arkansas? We're kind of like the Austin, Texas of Arkansas, you know? And she said something like, well, we're, we're hubbed out of Dallas, and we're, we're 
going to be operating stuff back and forth between Dallas and uh, Nashville, and there are states in between. So we're making no announcement at this time, but now some people in Arkansas are pretty excited. So it's making its way out there. What I want is um, I want uh, some um, the Whataburger. I've been to Texas enough times, I, I want that. Let's see, I'm just scro scooching through here. Four dollars and twenty cents, because it's Nevada. <laughs> From Senor Chunkza, he says he sent you Canadian pesos. I'll get the drink tax. Well, thank you, thank you very much, Senor, uh, Senor Four Twenty, and your Canadian, uh, the Canadian pesos and the drink tax. Water barricades. Okay, so that's the term for them. That's it. On my list, I've got a hundred ideas that you guys have sent me that I've come up with that friends have mentioned. And part of doing this is this does not replace the videos at all. The videos are still happening at the same rate they've had. In fact, I'm trying to make them happen more often, which is making me very tired. And I have a list of like a hundred things I want to cover. And one of them is talking to these companies who make smash barriers and crash barriers and water barriers and all this stuff. Um, and it's perpetually been like 11th on the list and then something new pops up. What these live streams do is allow me in a very kind of low cost production way because it's just the time of doing the research and then getting out here to talk to you about it. It allows me to have a second product uh, to put out. I, I don't know if it's going to happen monthly or whatever. A lot of it just depends on your own appetite. I want to look at this box. Let's show you something more interesting. Okay. But anyway, well, water barriers is one of them I'd love to do a video on. Um, I scrolled all the way to the bottom. Let's see. Where did Senor Chunkza come? Okay, next is my mom sent me $20. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> That's nice. You're never too old to, you know, have a mom. Okay, just an individual, $4.99. Thank you very much. I guess I'm supposed to do a dance. I need to think of something like road related because I, I don't dance. Austin Haney, or hi, H E Y N E, I apologize for my pronouncing name. Hot take in and out isn't very good. Okay, I've had this argument with people over the years where they say, oh, in and out is, is not that good. I've had a better burger at, at uh, uh, you know, um, Red Robin. Okay, well, that's fine. Red Robin is a $12 hamburger. Of course it's gonna be a $12 hamburger. in and out traditionally was like the $2 hamburger. With inflation, it's more like three bucks. And you get the double-double, it's like $4.50. But I'm saying, you go out and you shop amongst the burgers you can get for $4.50. It's the best of the cheap burgers, right? So it's in a different tier when you're comparing with Wendy's and stuff like that. in and outs pretty darn fresh. I live in California, sorry. I'm, I'm not going to dog on In-N-Out. It's, it's pretty good. But if you want a gourmet experience, like you want a really fancy burger with like, you know, peppercorns and blue cheese and a brioche bun and all this stuff, In-N-Out's not your guy. And that's okay. All right. Um, blah, blah, blah. Sorry, Rob, it's just a few weeks ago. Crazy to see how far along the construction is here. Do you think it'll be done by the Super Bowl? Sorry, what's that, ma'am? Yeah, it's going to get better. They're, when they're done, they'll have 10-foot uh, sidewalks on each side, but it's going to take a couple years. Um, do you think this will be done by the Super Bowl? Um, is Vegas host, hosting the Super Bowl? It won't be done. So looking at their... So I reached out to the Nevada Department of Transportation because that's what you guys pay me to do. And bless their hearts, Nevada Department of Transportation always is really good at responding right away with information to, to help me out. And I kind of hoped that they'd say, sure, in fact, we'd love to have one of our, you know, engineers or something, or, or even just community people come out and be part of the live stream. But they didn't. They just said, oh, here's a bunch of PDFs that you can pull off our website, <laughs> which is fine. I really appreciate them being very responsive. They got back to me the next day. Um, and I know in the past they were wonderful too. Like when I uh, did that story on Inter Interstate 11, I reached out to the project team. They got me in touch with the PR team up in Reno. I got to interview that uh, high level planner, I, I forget her name now, who really took me in depth, both on background and on camera 
about the the process to expand Interstate 11 through. So I, I but they've got their timeline here. We've got all their little fact sheets here showing what's going to close in what order. That first they'll close the northbound side, and then phase two they'll close the south side of the bridge and replace it. So this is the the pattern we're under right now, where you have this diverging diamond on the south half of what's left of the bridge. The flyover is closed and. The north half of the bridge is under construction. But they have the timeline here, and it's going to look. But I, I want to say, rats. And I didn't, of all the documents they sent me, I didn't print that one out. But I think it'll be finished in 2024. So depending on when Vegas is hosting the Super Bowl, if that's 2025, they might have it. But this will not be done by next February. It's just, they'll be halfway through it. It's a big project, even even in a warm climate like here, where they can work year round really on it. It's 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 a big project. There's a lot of concrete to pour. If they could if they could close the entire thing and just do a clean sweep, just demolish everything at once, build it all at once, they probably could do it faster. But they're trying to do open heart surgery because there's a lot of really bad traffic problems as it is just with what we're dealing with now. And this segues nicely into the di diverging diamond. I mean, the traffic just is, is all gummed up, not just in the main lanes, because there's, there's lane restrictions underneath this bridge, but there's a, a collector distributor. It's kind of hard to see, but you have the main lanes, and then behind it, you have the collector distributor lanes. And those all go off onto the Tropicana off-ramp. And even with the added advantage of the uh, diverging diamond, allowing people to make that left, um, you know, when it, right away without having to cross the oncoming traffic, they're still having some really bad performance issues. And it's going to be this way for a couple of years. And that's only with half the interchange open. Imagine if somehow they could have the diverging diamond working on both sides. So, okay. Uh, more comments here. Are you in Vegas for the temporary DDI only, or is there another reason? The other reason is right here. I love showing this off. Look at that. <laughs> we still haven't talked about this yet. Why they only tore down half the bridge. Why did they have to tear down the bridge at all? We'll get into that in a minute. Let's see what else we have here. I just want to make sure that uh, I'm catching up with the chat here. Sorry, I wish I could read every comment, but when I tried to do that on the uh, uh, last time, I got 20 minutes behind, and people were accusing me of pre-taping the live stream. Um, let's see. You're at Dropicana too. Yeah, it has the nickname Dropicana, and I think it's because they're dropping the bridge. I, I didn't quite follow, but it's a Vegas thing. Sort of like how in Las Vegas, every interchange is called a bowl, even if it doesn't look like one. So down that way to the north, is the spaghetti bowl and it makes sense because if you go to google maps you can even type in spaghetti bowl las vegas right now in another window if you're on a pc and put in spaghetti bowl las vegas the way the ramps are arranged it looks like a bowl of spaghetti so because they did that the henderson interchange that does not look like a spaghetti it's kind of like a modified stack interchange they call the henderson bowl and then another modified stack interchange up this way uh, toward North Las Vegas in the northwest part of the city where 95 meets the 215 freeway. They're calling that the Centennial Bowl, but it doesn't look like a bowl. <laughs> it's, just, <laughs> it's just a Vegas thing. It's so, I guess, NDOT and Nevadans being the way they are, they gave it a cute nickname and they call this Dropicana. So, because they're dropping Tropicana. CJ Brick, 499, thank you. Yo, Rob, if I wanted to study road and highway engineering, where do you want it, where should I start? Okay, there's like three parts to roads. There's sort of the, um, the context of how the road interacts with the city itself. That's urban planning, but urban planning gets into a lot of the why, the, the zoning, the land use. Transportation and land use are chicken and egg, right? You, you, end up with land uses that are reinforced by the transportation system you build and you build a transportation system that responds to the land use you have and if you really find that interesting 
you might even skip engineering entirely and go become an urban planner. Now realize, if you go into urban planning, it's a little harder to get a job, but when you do get it, you have to get a master's degree, typically, the people I've seen. And a lot of times you start off at very low pay as like a code inspector going around saying like, uh, oh, uh, you're, you didn't get a permit to add this tall item to your house, so we're writing you a ticket. And then you work your way up to inspecting plans to make sure they conform, conform with zoning laws and stuff. And eventually you can get into sort of the planning side of that, of how when the cities may, and, and regions make their transportation plan, looking at like, okay, here's where people are living, here's where they're going to live in 30 years, what kind of plan as the money, tax money comes in, what that 30-year regional transportation plan is going to look like, what the city's general plan is going to look like. That's the planning side. Then kind of in the middle is sort of the, the soft engineering. It's, it's getting the design engineering. It's getting in saying, okay, I'm building a Costco and I can't just, as Costco, let's pretend I'm Costco and I'm building a store. I can't just dump all the cars that are arriving, buying things and leaving onto the existing city streets scot-free. I'm going to impose a cost on the city because you're going to have thousands of people driving in and out of this Costco. So you need to do some planning to figure out, well, how much should Costco pay the city? Or what improvements should Costco install, like stoplights or road widenings or roundabouts? You go up to Redding, California right now, they're putting in a new Costco, and Costco paid to put in a really nice roundabout on their dime because of all the traffic they're going to create. So that, that's, you get, that you'd go get a civil engineering degree with a focus kind of on the traffic and planning operations, getting in and like optimizing stoplights. Um, safety, you could get into to dealing with uh, looking at crash rates and trying to figure out what roads the state should prioritize spending money on. And typically you'd end up for working for a state or for a private consulting firm. And then there's the, the design engineering, the hard engineering where you actually, and not hard because it's difficult per se, but hard because you're actually dealing with concrete. Getting out there and being a field engineer and making, inspecting the work to make sure it's being built properly. Um, getting in with the CAD software and actually designing the road. And so it, it's kind of neat because you have a broad spectrum there. So a lot of it depends which way you lean. If you lean more toward kind of the soft side, you may have a lot less hands-on aspect because you're just making a plan if you're an urban planner, but ultimately you don't get to make decisions. That's for city councils and developers to decide, uh, politicians but you help guide them to make good long-term decisions. And maybe putting in a good plan in 30 years, you get to see some neat things materialize. On the hard side, you may get to design a handicap ramp for a sidewalk today that's gonna to be built in six months. And so you get to see it right away. The downside is, is uh, it, it's more math oriented. It's getting in more to the hard engineering. So a lot depends which way you go. Like I said, this side would be getting a degree in urban planning. This side would be getting a degree in civil engineering. I, myself, I kind of fall in the middle. I like the operation stuff. I had an opportunity to either go get a master's in urban planning or go get the civil engineering degree, and I chose that. It is a lot easier to get a job. Civil engineering can be a tough profession. There's a lot of unpaid overtime and uh, billable hours and things that can almost feel like from people, I've, colleagues I've talked to, uh, it almost be like working at a law firm, kind of. But on, but on the flip side, you get to be really good at something. You can go eventually start your own firm. and So it's, it's a pretty big window there. But uh, I would say, take a few uh, civil engineering classes and, and maybe do a minor in urban planning and just kind of play with it. See, you know, it'll start to be where you fit, or fit in or not. Uh, any chance of a video on a New Jersey jug handle? Oh, it went all the way to the bottom. Uh, at some point, I got to get to New Jersey. And then when I get there, I could show you a New Jersey jug handle, but like I want to go deeper than that. And I don't, I, I mean, like, need to figure out who to talk to, whether that's somebody at, uh, like, I want to really dig into Google Scholar and see if there's somebody who has like some yummy info on why jug handles got built in New Jersey. If you don't know what a New Jersey jug handle is, I've never seen one. I've just seen them on Google Maps. Instead of making, <laughs> instead of just putting in a left-hand turn lane, so you pull up, you, you're, you're driving down the street and you pull in the left-hand turn lane and you wait for your arrow or whatever and then you make your left turn and you go. New Jersey decided <laughs> to have you 
basically pave a field off to the side and you make a you go right like it's a freeway ramp and then you make a hard left turn so you're facing the intersection at 90 degrees and then you wait for a green light now going this way and then you drive straight across i mean that, that that's kind of neat right because we talk about phases and intersections earlier right what's your probability you get a green light and if you can reduce the number of phases you get better probability so if you have a street that's going this way that has a green and a street that's going this way that has a green and the people making left-hand turns don't get an arrow either because they turn left uh, they yield uh, to traffic or they have a jug handle or they go around like this well then you have two phases this way and this way right so that's 50 percent odds that you get a green light that's, that's pretty good but if you have the left turn arrows like they do in california and in texas and in all in all over the place well now you have like a technically a 25 percent chance right it's not quite that because the lengths of the phases are not the same but and so because you you have one two three four and, and so the, the jug handle gets rid of that. You, you, you no longer have that phase for the turning vehicles. Okay, where were we? Man, I'm falling way behind because you guys have so many good comments. It's not your fault. It's just I, I get chatty. Where did I just leave off with CJ Brick? Okay. Do -do -do. I've got to skip like a hundred comments. I am so sorry. No, I've showed you plenty of traffic cones. Okay, last Vegas the Super Bowl in 24. Yeah, it will not be done in time for the Super Bowl. $10 from Aaron of Minneapolis, who says, big thanks, also kind of surprised they're doing triple left turn lanes rather than a permanent DDI. So in the, um, any big project like this, if you really want to geek out, if they're building a big road project, especially if it involves, exclusively if it involves federal money, which is most big projects, they get some federal aid. This is like half federal money, half Nevada state gas tax. They, the, the National Environmental Policy Act that Richard Nixon signed in the 70s requires that they have to go through and document all the ways the project can impact the environment, the human environment, the ecological environment, all the environments. And but what the good thing about it is you get a good project because they go through and write down every possible way that this could, and, and what we can do to mitigate it. But the neat thing too is you can go in and you can see all the designs, all the different ideas that they took to final consideration and why they ruled out what they did. Look at, looking at cost effectiveness and three of the ideas, one was a permanent DDI by, and eliminating the flyover. Another was uh, a permanent spooey. That's the kind where everybody kind of comes off and there's a single point in the middle. Spooey is an acronym for single point urban interchange. You, you may have seen one of those where you come off the freeway and you make a left, go halfway across the bridge, stop, and there's a single light in the middle. And that goes back to phases again, right? Because instead of having three phases on this side of the freeway or two phases on this side of the freeway and two phases on this side, two or three phases on this side, you end up with just three phases at one point. And so you can move the probability people are getting a green and keep moving is excellent. But I think they were working on those ideas on the thought that this flyover bridge, they were gonna have to tear it down and it would just be too expensive to replace it. And the design they ended up coming up with is saying, we actually, we can continue to do a diamond interchange like we have all along because we can keep half of the old bridge and just rebuild the half that we need to rebuild. And that's a good segue into talking, why only half the bridge? Well, why did they tear down any of it? Well, the columns of where this thing would land all sort of came out right on top of where that frontage road is gonna come straight through here. And so that is why it got demolished to this point, because that's as far as it could come before it was uh, blocking the frontage road. So the new bridge will straighten, instead of the arc continuing, it'll straighten out for a little bit and then, and then arc over. They'll, they'll change the angle of the arc in such a way that it um, lands out. Uh, I think it'll go over the frontage road and then kind of back over onto the, you know, so the freeway traffic coming off kind of scooches over the frontage road and then onto the flyover. But by keeping that, 
and just having a massive type diamond, I think they found that was what performed the best and kind of gave them the best bang for their buck. If they had had to, and, and the public meeting I was watching, the NDOT representative, was, she was saying that uh, that was thanks to the contractor. So rather than Nevada DOT um, totally just coming up with a design themselves, they, they got talking to people in industry and saying, well, what are some things we could do if you guys are going to bid on this? And I guess they came back and said, hey, you can keep half of this flyover, and that saves you a lot of money because you don't have to rebuild that part. Bridges, uh, building a bridge is one of the most expensive parts of, of a uh, freeway project because you, you just, you end up with a uh, huge expense because a bridge is, is kind of like a building that you can drive a semi truck on, you know? <laughs> and so you put it in that regard, it's like, oh, I guess that makes sense why a freeway is so expensive. Because you just lay some asphalt on some really nice um, sub-base material, you know, engineered dirt and gravel that's compressed it's really not that expensive, but as soon as you have to grade separate and go over, well, yeah, now you're on a building, so it becomes really, really expensive. So again, yeah, thank you very much, Aaron. Um, let's see, I'm trying to get caught up here. Somebody mentions it, it was the stream started at 7 p.m. on the East Coast. Yeah, that's why I start at four, because I'm trying to hit that sweet spot where I'm getting like, it's late enough that people on the West Coast, if, America can tune in if they want, and uh, but not too late back east, especially if we keep meandering and talking for way too long. David McDonald, Australia, 99 cents. Thank you very much. Um, trying to get caught up here. David McDonald again, Australia, another five dollars with a question this time. Here they are making, uh, they're building long tunnels, sometimes several kilometers or miles through mountains, but tunnels have issues too, and that can make a great topic. Yes, um, someday, <laughs> someday, I, I get back up to uh, the Northwest. <coughs> Last summer I filmed in Portland, and though that video still hasn't been made yet because I'm still <coughs> been working on all the other videos, and wanted to get up to Seattle sometime because they had um, a digging machine that's the same kind that uh, Elon Musk's boring company bought, you know, his fancy toy. But uh, a real, I don't want to say real, but a real company that knows what they're doing <laughs> bought one of these and, and tunneled, they took an old viaduct. It was this ugly free, double-decker freeway bridge made out of metal, had been sitting out in the rain and rusting since the 1950s. And after the 2001 earthquake in Seattle, the uh, engineers came back because the viaduct, parts of the viaduct started falling apart. And they said, hey, just to let you know, this really ugly viaduct that nobody wants, but we kind of need, it will fall down in a major earthquake and kill people. Just want to let you know. So they tore that down and replaced it with a freeway that goes as a tunnel underneath uh, the waterfront area of Seattle. It's really cool. It had a lot of problems where it, uh, as I understand, they hit, they hit like a pipe that they didn't know was there and they had to dismantle the whole machine and it sent them back six months or a year. Fascinating story. Got to find the right person to talk to and then get up there and of course edit the thing. So, so it's not, not a video that's going to come out right away, but I, I do and uh, because tunnels, if, if we could find cost effective ways to do tunnels, um, well, then you wouldn't need a flyover ramp. You just tunnel underneath the freeway and come out the other side. And sometimes they've done some creative interchange projects like that, but um, certainly in the Western United States in particular, uh, tunnels are pretty rare. Okay, next comment. Every, every time I click out, it uh, drops out. Viva, Viva Las Vegas, Tun tunnels are boring. <laughs> That's a good one, Nick. <laughs> New Jersey junk handles are in the MUTCD, but they are not called that in the book. Okay, so that's a good place to start. That phone book style manual on uniform traffic control devices, which controls everything. Uh, in fact, a video I'm working on right now starts there. So I thought that's much of a tease. Okay, that pedestrian crossing sign is not safe. You talking about the one here? Let's, let's take a look. So, the, the good news is there's so much congestion approaching this thing that uh, 
yeah, it's it's. I mean, they've they've had they have it. It's very temporary, as with everything here. But most of the time, the traffic really struggles to zoom on here, simply because the uh, the cars uh, they get they get backed up here in the queue, waiting for the crossover. This would be a good time. Let's take a look at the crossover here. So. They had some problems when they first opened this of people definitely going the wrong way. And uh, I don't know what they changed on it because I didn't get a chance to get out here before they, before they did. But the idea is you want to pinch everybody in a real tight spot here at the crossover so that there isn't enough room for people who are unfamiliar with it to just go straight through. And then that's uh, that video I, where I interviewed uh, the guy who brought the DDI to America is saying is he said you really have to you play with the geometry to try to figure out how to keep people from doing the stuff they're not supposed to do now one of the challenges uh, one of my first chicken videos crossing ddis is i'm now in a situation i want to cross here and i don't dare because everybody's so enthusiastic they've been waiting in such a long line down there that now that they have an opportunity to make a free left they don't want to stop, although this person's stopping anyway. Well, we'll take advantage of it. So here we are crossing the ramp and the signs, the very temporary signs here. Let's take a look at this uh, crossover here because imagine for a moment that you're coming uh, across the westbound direction. looking into the sun, so hopefully you can see. But you really want to make it look obstructed, where when you're, when you're driving down the street, you don't want it to look like you can just keep going straight. You really look like you got to cross over. Otherwise, you know, and so that's the idea of those uh, water barrels there, is really pushing the traffic that's coming towards us um, over. So they, they just don't feel they can, like it would be really wrong it's not a rounded corner there, it's a really tight one, so that, that way they kind of feel they have to, to come over to the other side. And, and it seems to work. Oh, they stopped because they got a red light. Okay. They don't have a DDI because technically you're on a one-way street and the ramp is a one-way street. Sometimes you can get away with saying, well, the state law says that uh, you can go from a one-way to a one-way on a red light, so, all right, you don't need to wait for the light. If you're right at the front, you can kind of take a yield to the crosswalk and then make your left, but that feels really uncomfortable. I know that that's the law, and even I don't like to do it, unless they specifically, if they explicitly put a white regulatory sign there that says, left turn on red, okay after stop or something, you know? But uh, it, it doesn't appear that there is one here. Now, you guys get a kick out of this sign up here? No U-turn? How the heck would you do that? And then uh, I don't like those arrows. It says right turn only. But what they mean is gradually drift back over, um, you know, when you get through the crossover. It's not really a right turn. And so, I don't know, I, I, I don't love it. But I did get a kick out of no U-turn. <laughs> I don't know how on earth somebody would do, do a U-turn at this intersection. All right. Let's see, private ambulances don't get the privilege. Oh, you guys talk about uh, EMS stuff. Donald, Don Donald Dodson with $10. Thank you very much, Donald. Uh, Wretched Rob writes, do you think a DDI could help with being backed up on reading the post? Yes, I know, I know, I'm way behind. <laughs> well, it's both, it, it, it's, it's both your comments and it's also so many things I wanna show you. I mean, I, I haven't even page past this guy. I've got like notes and, and cool things and then I end up reading your posts and we get distracted. Like here's the, the story to prove that even though the bridge is only two inches too short, it's five foot ten and or excuse me, fifteen foot ten instead of sixteen foot, trucks crash into it 
all the time. <laughs> There's a cool view right here of that uh, flyover being gone. A lot of bridges in Nevada and California are box girder bridges. They're ones made out of concrete. They build like a, a, a square-shaped box and then you drive on top of But this one's actually a steel bridge. So let's see, you know, in other places that you steal. And it's kind of interesting that you got the girders there and then you have the, the corrugated uh, metal on top of that and then they pour the bridge deck on top of that. And I'm just thinking, you know, when you're coming in and you're a demolition guy, you know, demolition, you just get in and wreck it. And they, they did a re really good job, you know, all those rivets and everything, disconnecting the old bridge in a pretty clean way where other than a little bit of bent stuff, you know, it's, it's I think it's actually looking pretty good where they can tie in the, the new bridge to that. All right. Getting caught up here. Do, do, do. Nice girders. Oh, yeah, let's talk about that. The County 215 sign makes the number way too small to read. I know. I Let's talk about this for a minute. All right. So you'll see here, here's the sign for the freeways. I'm going to stress everybody out because they're going to think I'm uh, trying to... But look at these, you have the standard interstate shields and letting people know what freeway that that ramp heads to. But there are these county shield signs and it's not often that you see a county highway signed like that on a freeway. But the way uh, Clark County, the county that hosts the, you know, Las Vegas and, and suburbs, built the 215 Beltway Half of it is an actual interstate highway, and the other half is a county highway, not even a state highway, a county highway that the county maintains. And so it has a county 215 shield. And I would uh, tend to agree with you, if you're zooping up to that sign really fast, um, it is a little hard to read those numbers. And I wish I better understood the politics. I, I, don't, I never lived in Nevada, so I don't understand the politics of how a major beltway was a county highway, but that is in the wild kind of a, a, a rare experience of, of something that you don't uh, typically get to see, and uh, but it's routine here. Well, let's walk over here. I'm going to show you uh, the uh, what's going on with this uh, distributor. So, just as we were talking about, frontage roads have to exist outside of the freeway. Um, to connect to driveways because you can't have a driveway on a freeway. That wouldn't be safe. There's a class of roads kind of between a frontage road and the freeway itself called a collector distributor road. The, um, normally, when you come on the freeway, you need some space to merge in. And when you go to exit the freeway, you need some space to safely exit. And when the freeway on-ramp and off-ramps get too close together, you end up with this weird thing called a weave where cars are coming on and cars are going off and, you, and it creates a lot of traffic and safety problems. So the right answer is to just, well, don't put your interchanges, your on and off ramps so close together. Give them a good mile and a half apart. But that's not the case here. You, 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 you just see you have a lot of activity here. You have to be able to uh, um, accommodate all, all these tourists who are coming out here the Las Vegas Strip. Um, the, the next exit down this way is only 5,000 feet. And so that's really not enough space. It's not even a mile. So to help make the cars flow better, you can build a freeway next to the freeway that's not a frontage road and you still wouldn't connect driveways to it. It still has high speed ramps on it, but it has a wall separating it from the main lanes of the freeway so that, that way the main lanes of the freeway can be focused on going through and this collector distributor road off to the side can deal with slower traffic at maybe 45 or 50 miles an hour weaving as people come on and merge off. And amazingly, with this old 1960s bridge, I don't know how they did it, but decades ago, Nevada DOT somehow figured out, it's closed right now, but they figured out how to put this collector road here in underneath the same bridge and I think what they did was <coughs> it used to be 
where and you've seen the bridge where you have the, the the bridge is to the outside of the freeway and then there's a column here that holds the bridge and then there's like a sloped piece of uh, concrete at a 45 degree angle or whatever 30 degree angle to kind of hold the soil back and then the bridge rests on an abutment up here well the uh they, they built a retaining wall and used that area that was for that uh, you know 30 degree slope of soil or whatever and squeezed one lane through here and then that lane goes to an exit that's literally right here by the arena so there's an uh, just as there's dean martin drive on this side there's another street over here and i oh my gosh the name just uh Hold on a second. That guy really is trying to walk over there with no sidewalk? He is one brave soul. There's no sidewalk. He's got about six inches between the concrete wall, the, the K-rail, and uh, the cars. That is, that's ambition. <laughs> anyway, where was I? So you have, like the, the back side of all these casinos, there's another street named after Celebrity that runs along this side too. And it actually, I, I think, goes underneath. It, it, uh, it crosses under just beyond this traffic light. There's a bridge that takes it under. And uh, to get access to all these employee garages that are on the freeway side of the strip, because all the, all the pretty parking garages face Las Vegas Boulevard down, down that way, um, so they put all the, the staff, the thousands of people who work these casinos, they park them here and to help them get to work. Because if you, if you think about it, I, I had a, a consultant once come and, and talk to me when I was in grad school about a project they were doing for the resort. It was the traffic study for the Resorts World Casino down that way to figure out how much Resorts World would have to pay for their huge hotel and improvements that they would have to pay to install. And he said something interesting to me about Las Vegas I'd never realized, which is in Las Vegas, all the money that gets spent is not to get tourists to the Strip. That's a side effect. It's to get Clark County residents who pay motor fuel taxes and sales taxes and everything that funds the roads. It's to use their money to serve the people of Clark County. And so, yeah, there are Clark County residents who go to the Strip, so we get nice improvements for the Strip. There are Clark County people who want to get past the Strip. So there are neat roads. Sometime I can show you on a future thing. Um, way down there is a street called Desert Inn. It's a super arterial. And what Desert Inn does is it crosses over the freeway, under the Strip, and it, it goes from like the east side of Las Vegas to the west side with no stoplights, but it's not a freeway. It's just a road because Clark County residents need something to get from one side to the other and not have to deal with all the tourists. And so it's the same thing here. Going back here, I've got a point to this. <laughs> I'm not just rambling. This collector distributor road takes you underneath the bridge and dumps you out on um, this other street over here that's named after the celebrity who I forgot. So that employees who are Clark County residents their tax money is helping them get to work. So anyway, I thought that was pretty interesting. So part of the new bridge is widening this collector distributor so that it actually uh, has two lanes instead of just the one so that they can get more cars to that traffic signal and get them through on the left. Because if this thing, say if too many people go to work in the morning by car and the red light for that backs all the way up down this single lane, it can start blocking the people coming off the uh, distributor over there. So if you have the two lanes, that performs better. And this is all stuff that the, the engineers don't just wing. Part of that environmental impact statement is doing traffic modeling. So what they, what, and that's a whole fascinating thing in itself that you could, if you're interested in becoming an engineer, you could become a modeler modelers what they do it's kind of like sim city except a little more boring and what you do is you take this existing freeway interchange and you go in the computer and you say how many lanes there are and you position where all the ramps are and everything to scale and then you come out and you count loud motorcycles you count how many cars there are 
during like the busiest part of the rush hour. And you put that in the computer and you run it to see if the uh, your model matches what really happens in the real world. And if it does, then you have something amazing because now you can come in and without spending a dime on concrete making mistakes, you can get in with your model and actually start to see, okay, well, what if I made this thing two lanes? What if I made this, uh, took this flyover away? What if I put in a DDI? What if I, and come up and, and just keep playing with it until you come up with something that is as simple as possible, cost effective as possible, but you go, wow, this really moves the cars. Then you can get in and you can take population projections. You can say, well, we got this population now and we're planning for 30 years from now. And what percentage of that population is going to use this facility? How, how's the traffic going to grow based on models of things that are going to get built? And then with that growth projection, you can stick that back in the model, run it again and say, okay, no, not just what performs best in 2025 when this thing's done, how does it perform in 2050? And so, you know, and, and the model may change, right? You know, and there's induced demand where you may accident, accidentally encourage more people to drive because you, you built the thing. Um, so that, you know, nothing's perfect, but it does put a little bit of science to the engineering before you waste money on the concrete and go, oh, well, that was a mistake. We shouldn't have built that. Oh, well, $100 million later, uh, you know. So uh, that's a fun aspect you can get into modeling. You know, it's it's really neat. No one plays SimCity anymore. They play City Skyline. I know. I I that's probably there's like three questions uh, a fan like you is most likely to ask me that I, I hear all the time. One of them is uh, you do a, a video on Michigan lefts or New Jersey jug handles, and the answer is yes. I know because everybody wants. Um, one of them is. Uh, do you play City Skylines? And I'm going to give you the straight answer. I tried. The way I play SimCity is just not compatible with City Skylines. I don't want to build high rises and stuff. That's not fun. I'm getting into it for the traffic. So I added Network Edition Mod, which really like makes a mess of your traffic network and just makes it very car dependent and nasty. And I modded SimCity for so that the uh, region was basically the size of the Bay Area with a bunch of inland stuff. And then I started back in the George W. Bush administration, like back then with my modded version, like 2007 or 2008. And it worked on it for like 12, 13, 14 years of sprawling it out to only like 15 million people, but it was all through suburban sprawl. Like I, I had to build another arterial mile block. I'd put in a bunch of twisty neighborhood streets, zone each little house. It was my time waster, you know, and I, so that's why I never got into gaming. So then I go play City Skylines and oh my gosh, City Skylines is fantastic because you're not limited to the, the pre-designed freeway interchanges and things, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> that SimCity Network Edition mod gives you, you can actually get in and draw the ramps. I thought this game is going to be so great. So I start to build my sprawl model because that's what I want to build. Like I want to fight nasty, just terrible commuter traffic. And uh, they give you, City Skylines gives you a box that's about this big. And you can put about two buildings in it. And I don't even get to talk about how the my city connects to the regional network because they've decided that there's already a regional highway with a T interchange that comes in and that's my one way in and one way out of my region. And I know there's ways to mod it and stuff, but I just didn't have the time. Like I, I spend all my time doing this stuff. So I, you know, I, I, I would love to tell you that yes, I play City Skylines and as a result, you're not gonna get a video for two months because I've been busy playing City Skyline, but I don't think you'd like that. Uh, let's see. Thanks for the congrats. Uh, that's from Get Owned Incorporated. I still play SimCity 2000 once in a while. Yeah, I know. SimCity 2000's a lot of fun. City Skylines is getting a sequel. Not much is known about it yet, so it writes Jonathan. Yeah, and I, I hope they fix that, because I, I just want, like, a nasty mega region. Like, I just want to, like, rebuild Los Angeles with all the same mistakes. And, and then kind of have fun, like, retrofitting it, playing with it to see it. Yeah, I know I'm in it for the traffic. That's fun. Okay, let's get more caught up with some of the newer comments. Jimmy writes, hey, Road Guy Rob, I remember in your red light camera video, 
that you were at an intersection in Menlo Park that I drive by. Yes, yeah, and the reason I did that, I happen to be passing by the Bay Area, and I never miss up an opportunity. I keep a camera in my car, so don't break into my car, because I never, and I keep, I keep an outfit in my car, because I never know if I'm gonna be passing by someplace and wanna tape something while I'm there, because I'm trying to keep costs down. They cost, you know, gas isn't cheap, and, but this is the type of content. You kinda have to go to the place to show it, you know? And when I was talking with uh, the expert uh, I interviewed on that story, Jay Bieber, he was the one who was giving me some case studies of like, here's some news stories you ought to look into, and one of them was Menlo Park. So when I was passing the Bay Area, I went to Menlo Park and to uh, the, um, I forget, it's the town, Milpitas, no. It's the town where the two freeways connect on a road that should be a freeway, but right in the middle of it, there's a stoplight, and everybody was running the yellow light there because it was too short. So I, I hit both of those on the same afternoon. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's a beautiful area. Anybody who can afford, yeah, Fremont, thank you. Anybody who can uh, afford to live in the Bay Area, I, I don't blame them. I mean, it's, it's like they took LA, added trees and hills, um, got rid of all the broken looking stuff, although some of it's coming back. The downside is they didn't build enough places to live because somebody decided that when Moses came down with the 11 commandments, the 11th commandment says, and thou shalt only zone single family houses and whatever houses got built in 1974 shall stay there forever, thus saith the Lord, you know, or whatever. So as a result, you have all these neighborhoods, they're beautiful because the houses were built in 1974 and you can't build any more houses. So the houses are a hot supply. They're, they're Tickle Me Elmo, they're rare Pokemon cards. They're, and so people pay millions of dollars for a building that really the building is only worth 200 grand, 300 grand, but there's three parts to a house, right? There's the land. Well, that's valuable because it's limited. There's the house. Well, that just sits out in the rain and rots. And then there's the third thing nobody ever talks about. Government permission to have a house on that piece of land. And that's limited. And so the Bay Area is all messed up. All of America is kind of messed up now because that government permission to have a new house is limited. If you don't have empty, vacant fields that you can build new houses in and you have no way to increase supply because the government permission says thou shalt have only one house per lot, well then, now well, that's what you get on, on affordable houses. Um, let's see. Those drivers stuck in traffic on I-15 when they suddenly see this person on a bridge with a tripod blabbering about random things. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's, uh, it's exciting. I, I could be, uh, you know, down there just hanging out, listening to music. But uh, that, that's what's interesting about this project is there's a, there's a tendency to say, oh, well, all these people are stuck in traffic, so we must make the freeway wider so that we can accommodate all these people. But that's, that might be the right answer, but it also might be a really bad answer because what may be causing the traffic isn't here. That's already plenty wide. It's something way down there that's constricting supply and so, or constricting volume. And so if you just widen the freeway on this side of the constriction, you just end up throwing more traffic at whatever's clogging you up down lower. And so, you know, sometimes the right answer isn't to widen a road. Sometimes it might be to widen a different road or, or connect two roads together that should be connected and aren't, you know. It might be to figure out whether some of it could be accommodated by some sort of a transit project or whether future land use can. And so I, I do appreciate that it used to be engineers kind of did their thing and planners did their thing and, and they just learned to kind of hate each other. And um, that really changed, I think, in the 90s. And, and you really see, if you go to uh, Transportation Research Board, which is a Comic Con in Washington, D.C. every January for anybody in the transportation industry. I'd love to go again. I got to go in grad school once as a student. Plan 
plan, planners go to that thing. Like it's not just uh, engineers. And so I, I, I do think we're starting to get better projects for everybody, including drivers, because planners and engineers are talking to each other. You know, they can sit down and say, oh, maybe if we spent $100 million uh, on this transit project, it would save us $200 million on this road project. And that's not a bad thing. It's not to say we don't do the road project in the future, but maybe we can put it off 10 or 20 years because it buys us some time, you know? Let's see, Jimmy, he answered your question. Oh, good, I don't remember. I would venture to guess that 50% of your viewers live within 30 miles of I-15. Well, yeah, because <laughs> it's funny you mention that because I noticed when I did the video Phoenix without freeways, I ended up with a whole bunch of YouTube stats that said, oh yeah, like your number two state is uh, Arizona. And so I would love, and I'm trying to get in this direction, it, it, it's, I'm saving, uh, believe it or not, as, as little as I make off of Patreon, I'm trying to save it so that I can have money to go video like a circuit, like, like take three weeks and, go hit like 10 stories and hit places that deserve to be in videos, but I never get there. You know, Minnesota and Indiana and Oklahoma and, you know, so I can come back because I really think transportation is not just a Western US thing. And eventually I would really love to go see roads and, and, and experience uh, roads in the UK and in, in Germany and in Eastern Europe and Latin America and, and well, China, I don't know if I'd go right now, but um, but definitely Korea and Japan and Australia. You know, many of you are Saturday morning in Australia, I think, and so I'd love to see Australia. Australia uses the, the, the MUTCD of America, basically. I would be a hoot to see, very, see that in person and not just on Google Street View, but not because I would want to go see it and have a trip. It would be to share it with you. But... Uh, one step at a time. I, I'm, I'm trying to provide stuff as fast as I can and grow, you know, grow it slowly so I don't get burnt out and run out of money. And what are your thoughts on I-5 going through downtown Seattle? I need, to, I need to drive it. I have not been to Seattle. I've only made it to Vancouver and uh, in Vancouver, Washington. I do know there's a great uh, YouTube compilation. Check this out when you're done with this. Seattle, um, I forget which exit it is, but it's one of the downtown exits on I-5. And it's a section that's like a short tunnel. It goes under, I think, some buildings. And the sign warns you, ramp 15 miles an hour, but doofuses, you know, like me, in the rain, come zipping along full speed of 50 miles an hour and think, I, you know, I'm in a Honda, I can take this ramp. So they take it <laughs> and it's somebody's compilation where they, they live in a, they live or work in a building that's right where the, the, the tunnel dumps them out onto the city street and there's a stoplight onto the one of the one way downtown streets. And it's everybody, it's just one car after another, skidding and sliding along the wall, just you hear, just, you know, bang, and you can't see it. And after about three or four seconds of hearing just this terrible sound, you see sparks and smoke and some beat up car dragging along a wall <laughs> coming to a stop. It's fantastic. So um, I'd like to not experience that, but it would be fun to see that, that ramp sometime. And so then I can have an opinion on Seattle. Seattle's got so many neat things, the floating freeway bridge, the floating concrete bridge, uh, the 11 foot eight bridge. I need to look that up. Um, the one that's uh, the short bridge in, oh gosh, is it Tennessee or Kentucky or someplace? But a guy has a montage of that as well. And I'd love to, if I could ever get a hold of that guy and I was out that way, it would be fun to talk to him about what possessed him to put a car, a camera up and capture all these people, you know? And, and, and partly why are there infrastructure money issues? Why that state or, or city or county haven't replaced that 11 foot eight bridge yet, you know, because if you haven't, people uh, can opener their U-Hauls all the time. Durham, North Carolina, thank you. Yeah, I, I saw one that looked similar to it in Memphis and I got excited and it wasn't it. So it, uh, yeah, 11 foot eight, that, that, that bridge is a, is, is a hoot.
but uh, car, um, it's an obvious schism, right? It's car culture is the problem. It, it, this, is, this is where it gets complicated because we didn't just develop a car culture because we just all of a sudden woke up one day in the 19, you know, 40s or 1920s even and decided, hey, uh, we all love cars now and we're going to do this. I, I don't think in 1925 or in 1950, we sat down and thought this is the world we want for ourselves. But the car showed up and it just provides such neat, I'm going to set this on the ground so I don't drop it on the freeway. It, it, it does such a neat job of serving a transportation purpose that we kind of need, which is many to many. So you think about uh, like a high-speed bullet train. A bullet train is amazing from point to point. But transit and transit systems, trains and things do great. If you're going from a certain point where you have many people at a single point going to another single point where there's many people and they're all like within walking distance or really good transit that connects to it. But in order for that system to work, those points have to be really, really dense. And so like that's why Japan has amazing transportation, which I'd love to go see sometime, because it has very dense populated centers. They have to be very careful with land use control because if they did American style suburban sprawl, they'd run out of places to grow what little food they can, you know. It gets, it gets a little more complicated in the United States because we have very strong um, property rights here. They call it fee simple, where basically your deed, unless it's written out of the deed, like you don't have the water rights or the oil rights or whatever, you own everything. And so the culture in America is, you wanna build a house and you hit minimum standards for it, you can build a house. You want to build a business? So as long as you hit some minimum standards, some zoning and utility requirements, you can build it. And especially as you head back east, most of the land is in private hands. And so it's really difficult to stop somebody from developing their property. And so that's how those uh, infamous strodes happen. Strode is not an engineering term. It's a term to describe a really bad road that's trying to be a highway and a city street at the same time. And it, does a yucky job. There was an author of a book uh, called Strong Towns that came up with that term. But the engineering term I would use is it's a bad road. <laughs> it's a highway that also has a lot of driveway connections and businesses on it because those, those, those roads just sort of naturally happen. They're, they're almost impossible to stop that kind of development in the U.S. And so that's how we became car dependent is because everybody did their development piecemeal. There was no big plan. It was like, well, the, this private property owner wants to build a neighborhood and this private property owner wants to build a shopping center and this private property owner wants to do that. And they're doing it in places that we say there is an acceptable place. It's commercial zone, residential zone or whatever. So that leaves us just kind of coming in after the fact and saying, well, People, the only way you can get one person from many places to a, many places here in this very decentralized system, the car just showed up and it did what human feet and uh, bicycles and horses had always done, which is give you just independent autonomy to go where you want to go. The challenge is we all wanted to do it at the same time. <laughs> and that's where it does it. A car, if only you owned a car and you're the only person who owns the car it would be amazing but we we're, we're an, we try to be egalitarian and if you can have a car well i should be able to have a car and he can have a car and she can have a car and now we all have a car and we all try to drive home at the same time because somehow employers have decided that we need to be back in the office <laughs> and so there you go and uh well, then you have a bunch of taxpayers who just want to get home from the office. And they're captive in this. And they're like, hey, tax me whatever. Just get me out of this thing. So you go do the feasibility study and you say, well, we could totally transform the Las Vegas region and it would cost trillions of dollars and decades to do um, to make it where it's like Tokyo, where we could all take trains and stuff. And people are like, oh, but I want my house. Other people, they can go live in the high density, but I want my house. 
And so we're back to this, where it's like, rather than having the deep discussion of like, should we have a big transformative discussion about the region? Well, we could just add a lane. That's, that's cheaper and easier. So we keep doing that, because it's easy. But, you know, I'm good with, like, let's start with the little things. We don't have to completely transform a region. Let's start with, I don't know, put in a 10-foot sidewalk so that people who are here visiting don't have to rent a car. That's one fewer car they have to rent. You know the other one that I think they should do? <coughs> they have a, a partial monorail system. It's, it's not all connected together. It's like little pieces. There's a piece east of Las Vegas Boulevard that's actually functional. And then there's a pieces of it on the west side. They don't tie together. Spend the money to tie them together. And then here's a crazy idea. Tie it out to the airport so that people can at least get as far as the strip on a monorail. You already have half of it built. Like that would be that would be neat. And then you have fewer taxis coming from the airport. You know, Ubers nowadays. You know. Speaking of which, that was nuts. When I went to New York, um, I never got out of my car because I did New York wrong. I was just there for the afternoon. I grew up watching the movie Home Alone, and you see the streetscape of Fifth Avenue, and it's all yellow cabs. There weren't any yellow cabs. It's all Ubers. <laughs> Everybody had those license plates with the T for Taxi and Livery Commission, you know? So I knew it was an Uber. They had the Uber lights, the Uber stickers, the Lyft stickers. But uh, it made me a little sad. I, I never got to experience the, the dirty old nasty 90s New York that had the yellow cabs everywhere. Okay, let's see what comments I'm falling behind here. Durham, North Carolina. They wanted to add FM transmitters to emergency vehicles so they could override the car radio. Oh, but man, that would be... That wouldn't work nowadays because everybody's listening to their podcasts. Okay, I'm going to scroll down a little bit. Uh, Road Guy Rob, fun video for you to film next time you're in San Diego. The stub of the I-5-163 merge. Yeah, uh, ghost ramps. If I, if I get time, I would love to do a Halloween video this year. Uh, and by telling you now, I'm kind of committing to do it. Ghost ramps, woo! You know, where they, they built a freeway interchange. Portland has a ton of them, which I mean, I'd have to go up there again, but um, where they intend to build a freeway. So they build a ramp and then they never finish it. I, I saw one in Connecticut. Uh, there's one in, uh, I, mean, I haven't been there, but Baltimore where they tore down a perfectly good neighborhood to put in an urban stretch of Interstate 70 that never got connected to Interstate 70 because they built the ghost ramp, but then that went through a rich neighborhood and they fought it and it never got built. So, uh, ghost ramps are, are, are pretty cool. And then, the, you know, the whole ghost thing. Uh, could you make a video on the mobile tunnel on Interstate 10? Oh, in Mobile, Alabama? Because I was going to say, I don't know of any... Uh, Interstate 10 tunnel, but that does sound familiar. I need to, that's what I'm saying. I, I'm gonna do is go through all the chat when I get home tomorrow and go, I have a Google My Maps and I keep putting pins every time you give me an idea that's, I put a pin in and then if I can drive through there, then that gives me an opportunity to maybe get a story out. Okay. Pete Martin, 999, thank you, Pete, says, is there an urban planning theory support more but smaller freeway routes over less but bigger freeway routes? I'm thinking of Minneapolis and Chicago, uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul versus Charlotte, for example. And yeah, that's crossed my mind because I grew up in Salt Lake City, which is roughly similar to Minneapolis, St. Paul. It's a little bit smaller of a region. And because Utah is very linear, it's like Miami where there's uh, geo geographical constraints for Miami as the Everglades and the Atlantic Ocean that put them in this long 95 corridor. The Wasatch Front's the same way. You have the Great Salt Lake or what's left of it and uh, mountains and lakes and things and then the Wasatch Mountains and so it's very long and skinny. So Utah, like Miami, is very dependent on the interstate highway that goes through it. So you have the one big, wide, huge route. Um, with some parallel stuff. Minneapolis is nuts. Minneapolis is nuts because it's got all these little two laners, you know, two lanes each way or three lanes each way, small freeways, but there's like a freeway every three or four miles. And uh, it would be fascinating to know, uh, I don't, and I don't know the answer to that because part of where you get um, the, the, the constraint where the freeway starts jamming up, bottlenecking, 
is at nodes where the two freeways connect together. Anytime, the, the best freeway in the world would be one that has no on-ramps. It just, it just goes, you get on it, and then the, yeah, you can exit off or whatever, because it's where cars enter, you have a lot of lane changes and things. And so you have Miami or Salt Lake City or LA or someplace, Texas, has one really wide freeway and everybody keeps entering on you have a lot of weaving of people trying to ch change lanes because they want to get over six lanes and so they so they have that problem on the other hand you have minneapolis where you have the nodes where you have all these freeway interchanges where they come together because you have that network that grid and so there's all these places that can cause weaving even though there's less weaving when the huh that's an that's an interesting one i i, I don't have an answer for you but uh if you like U-Hauls getting can opener, check out Storo Drive in Boston. Okay, I'll put a pin in that one. Thank you. That's five dollars from Andrew M. Uh, let's see, JSBN one two three with the uh, very specific amount of twenty-five dollars and sixty-nine cents. Writes, I like roads and guys and Rob. Well, thank you. Well, I appreciate that. I, I I will take a compliment from anybody who likes me. So thank you. Uh, Mr. 504 for 199. Thank you very much, Mr. 504. Thank you again, I should say. Thoughts on dynamic traffic signs on the freeway there? Yes, thank you for pointing that out. In fact, how can we see one? Where's the? Uh, let's uh, let's go let's go walk toward one. Uh, pick up my stuff here. I so want. Um, I, I so want to talk to NDOT about so many things. That's why I'm always a little sad when they just send me a press release and say, here you go. <laughs> I need to, I'll try again. Cause I know in the past they've, they've been very, very helpful. Just lately, I, both the DDI story and, and then this one, they just sent me materials. I didn't really get to go real deep with them, but I would love to take you guys on through a deep dive video into these electronic signs that they put on Interstate 15 here. And I'm gonna to try to zoom in. It's probably gonna be potato quality. Let's see if I can get it to focus. Come on. Yeah, it's, it's really struggling to focus. I think you probably can kind of see it. What they've done here is been able to mark dynamic speed limits with these overhead signs and also show you when there's traffic Say there's a crash in the number two lane, they can put a big red X over the number two lane to let you know it's closed or a big yellow arrow that says merge. So you know way ahead of time what's going on because sometimes you end up in a, you know, California, this happens all the time. I'm in a traffic jam and I know, well, I'm happy to start accommodating and moving out of the way of the traffic jam, but where is it? The, well, NDOT's giving you a solution. They'll tell you exactly where the jam is start moving you over. Oh. <laughs> People walking by hoping <laughs> they could crash it thinking it was in selfie mode, but uh, they missed out. Anyway, um, <laughs> where was I? So this is pretty cool. The other aspect of this too is not just the dynamic overhead signs, but it's the fact that they can um, change the speed limit dynamically. So. I, my intuition as a driver, and it's a wrong intuition, is that, well, you, you set the speed limit to 65, and then when there's stop and go traffic, well, you want people, as soon as there's a, you know, the traffic clears out, pedal to the metal, get back to 65. Well, <coughs> it creates this sort of seesaw effect where it's uh, speed up, slow down, speed up, slow down, speed up, slow down. It's like a, a choppy uh, wave, you know, wave pool. And that would be fine, except the way we are as human beings, we accelerate much more slowly than we brake. Braking, we'll all brake pretty fast together because it's do or die. You don't want to crash into the car in front of you. But taking off, well, some people like me gun it, and other people are leisurely and take off slow. And that rate of accelerating back up to the speed limit is slower than our braking speed. So every time you seesaw and you have that stop and go, you lose performance in the road. So the engineers were smart and they figured out, well, when it gets where it's seesawing like that, 
drop the speed limit. Right now it's not 65, it's only 55. And if you keep everybody going 55, that's faster than if you averaged, you know, 40 miles an hour section, 65 mile an hour section, 40 mile an hour section, 65 mile an hour section. You'll travel through the corridor faster at 55. Or, or they'll drop it all the way down to 35 sometimes. Um, sometimes they'll have the carpool lane five miles an hour faster than the other lanes because it's moving while the other lanes are jammed up. There's so many neat aspects to that. I absolutely crave coming back and doing a video on that. But the uh, problem I have right now is I, I have about five videos worth of material that I've already shot. Some of them I've already done the interview. They're in various stages of getting built. I'm actually working on three right now simultaneously. So those will probably be the next three videos. Um, and I kind of feel like I want to clear out my backlog of what I've already shot before I go shoot more stuff. But this would be one that I, you guys could twist my arm really easily on this uh, variable speed limit here on the 15 freeway. So, okay, um, let's see. I'm trying to make sure I'm not missing any, uh, especially super chats. I definitely don't want to miss because Mr. 504 again, thank you. Um, let's see. Do, do, do. Pete Hill, 999. Thank you very much, Pete. Pete writes, just clicked for me. The 15 is full from California weekenders. Missed you when you were in my LA neighborhood in the San Fernando Valley, now in Huntsville, Alabama. I hope you like Alabama. I, I mean, the San Fernando Valley is an interesting one because it's uh, definitely, uh, there's great and terrible things about the, about the San Fernando Valley. But uh, Alabama's beautiful, but uh, you know, it's also humid and muggy, you know. Um, let's see. Matt Brannigan with $5. Thank you, Matthew Brannigan, and your uh, German S set character for your uh, avatar there. There's actually a crash to your left, Rob. Perfect example. Oh, man, so this is what happens when I fall behind. Let's see. Was it the one that was down here, over here on the left? I think I might have spotted that. But yes, dynamic lanes would allow them to say, hey, there's a traffic on the, on the right-hand lanes, merge over. You know, some, it's something that they can use. Um, I don't think these signboards were cheap because it's really hard to tell with this, again, potato quality zoom with my phone. But um, when you see these signs in person in broad daylight, they look really good. Like they, they have almost kind of, they, they don't have that destroy your eyes glow. They almost kind of have a, I wouldn't say a paper white quality, but they, they look really good. And uh, that can't be cheap. You know, I can maybe reach out to the, I don't see if I can catch today the vendor's name. Maybe they'd want to talk to us too. Uh, uh, West State's gig works as Seattle has the same dynamic signs. Um, Spencer uh, Mosher for five dollars. Thank you, Spencer. He writes, they need to connect the monorail between all the hotels on the strip. Also, I do like the digital speed signs. Faster speeds on the number one and two lanes is nice. Yeah, I, I, I've had a great experience. I went from being a skeptic. I'm going, no, dynamic uh, speed limits, that's just an excuse to slow, slow me down. And it's like, but I went through it. I was, I was going between Utah and LA and uh, it said 35. We moved consistently 35 through the whole thing. It was really neat. Uh, yeah, the monorail, uh, that's another one that's been on my list. What's held me up on the monorail video is I don't know who to talk to because the Las Vegas Convention and Visitors Bureau just bought it. And uh, kind of the angle I want to take is why has it kind of been a failure so far? You know, but not from the angle of like, ha ha, so you're stupid for building a monorail. But I want to understand why it's been a failure and what we can do to fix it, to make it into something that's viable, you know? Because the, the projects I've seen were the um, transportation planners. It's uh, uh, regional, oh shoot, RCTC. I forget what it stands for, but it's Clark County's regional transportation plan, R RTC, I think. But uh, RTC's plans, uh, working with uh, transit 
has been like bus rapid transit down um, Las Vegas Boulevard, which I don't think there's enough people here to warrant some type of a beefier, heavy rail type thing. I just don't know what the mechanism would be to pay for it, and maybe that's what's been holding it up. But uh, they got to do something because it's uh, the, 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 the strips. The last 20 years, it's only gotten bigger. Like, like I just don't see people giving up and not going to Las Vegas. You know. Mars, Misha, love you, Rob. Love you too, dude. Uh, City did, Nerd did a good video on public transit in Las Vegas and Clinton Monterey. Okay, I'll have to check that out. That's from Kaylin. Um, let's see. Uh, oh, yeah. Alex Great says uh, you're going to go see the drain thing. Uh, so we got a choice. So start chatting now what you want. I can walk over here and look at the drain. And I might still do that anyway. Or we could go for a little bit of a longer walk that way, and I can show you all the stair, the uh, uh, escalators that go over Las Vegas Boulevard. I, I, I showed it briefly in my, one of my videos about medians, uh, but we can go look at those or the drains or you know both. But real quick, while I tie my shoe, start voting what you guys want, and I'll, I'll be just a second. I got to tie my shoe. Uh, no, oh, I see my friend Dave Pruitt. One vote for drains, one vote for either. So, so far, drains are in the lead. S, one vote for escalator, two votes for escalator. I'll have to hit up Gordon Ramsay restaurant. Well, you guys tip me pretty well. I could either use it for gas money to get home or go to a Gordon Ramsay restaurant. Escalators, drain. Oh, you guys are, I'll just rip myself in half and we'll do two streams. We'll do both really quick. I want to go to the escalators because I don't want to backtrack and then come back. And uh, but we'll do both. We'll do both. I promise. I got nothing. I, this is how I choose to spend my St. Patrick's Day, and uh, I'm honored that you're choosing to spend it with me as well. Uh, okay, we're we'll walk toward the strip. But we will. I promise those that want to hang out for the drains, I will do the drains too. But uh, they're both they're both really cool. But I just I don't know. I it's like yeah. Anyway, taco escalators. You got me intrigued. I would love a taco escalator, whatever that is. Any thoughts on the future of I-11? Blaine writes. Um, I've been watching um, the public meetings and things they've been having because the next phase that uh, oh gosh I've forgotten her name but. She was the one who uh, was so kind and talked to me for a long time for the I-11 video. And so the next step is figuring out where does I-11 go through the Las Vegas Valley. And at the time, they, they, they hadn't ruled out anything. They were, they were saying, well, traffic stops. I'm not going to go. Everybody stopped on the freeway ramp here. So I don't think I'm going to get smushed. Um, they hadn't ruled out the thought of maybe building an additional freeway uh, for I-11 along the north side of the freeway, uh, north side of the city. But most likely, they were um, um, going to uh, take uh, the probably one of the existing freeways, either the 215 Beltway or uh, Highway 95, the 515 freeway. If you're those of you following along, uh, if you're following along on a Google map. The 515 freeway and making that I-11 instead, um, but they, they there's public meetings and things because they want to make a good decision, so that that way they don't, you know, if you, you part of what happened in the 60s and why we got some kind of crappy freeways is they just did it really fast and didn't really talk to anybody, you know, you could go from an idea to bulldozing stuff in 90 days, you know, and uh, now what they're doing is slowing down, trying to document everything. It costs more, it's slower, but the, the upside is that you, you do end up with uh, um, a better product when you're done. So it's, oh, this is interesting. They have, they're taking the sidewalk, instead of to keep going uh, straight toward the, uh, toward Las Vegas Boulevard, they, uh, they turn the sidewalk and go underneath this flyover ramp 
And even though the bridge is out, this is the bridge that they they demolished, and they definitely don't want anybody up there. But we'll just take it. Uh, they still don't want you crossing it because when it was open, you'd have cars probably going about 50 miles an hour through here, and putting a, a pedestrian crosswalk at the bottom of that ramp would probably be not safe. <laughs> not without a signal, anyway. And rather than you know signaling these really frustrated drivers who are just zooming off this thing feeling really happy that they get to go fast they're saying i could see them they're saying hey you got uh, a big bridge here anyway that could work to send pedestrians underneath so they they send us under underneath and i am falling behind on a few comments here you have a safety vest you can cross it <laughs> Jesse D writes, did you grow up in Salt Lake and move to LA? Yes. Or hold on, let me. I don't want to disturb this gentleman. Somebody's trying to sleep and I don't want to I don't want to bug him. He looks like he's having a bad day. Yes, I grew up in uh, the Wasatch Front of Utah and then after grad school moved to Southern California and I live in the Central Valley now, but uh, and I'm close, close enough to LA, I consider it LA. And there was another comment here from, oh, uh, JPN123 again with, with 2569s. That's such a fun number. That's very generous of you. Uh, JSBN writes, in and out or Gordon Ramsay? Eh, I'll take a double double. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's, it's good. It's, it's, it's good value for the, for the money and I don't know it's yeah, I like in and out but they, you know I kind of but I like what they've done here at this it was I'm all for direct connections for pedestrians but that wasn't too bad of a detour to be able to go underneath a high-speed flyover that's just that's just a good design I, I like that also really like this here the the barrier between uh, the traffic that's supposed to be going 35, but let's be honest, they're, they're not going 35. I should have brought, oh man, I have a, for Christmas, a friend gave me a speed gun. We could have been measuring how fast these people are coming off the bridge, but next time. But the barrier just make it, you know, it's not the prettiest thing. There are better ways you can do that when you have the space with, you know, trees and more, you know, more aesthetically nice stuff. But push comes to shove, that's good money well spent. I feel really, really good about walking down the sidewalk. I, you know, at least until the barrier gives out, I feel confident I'm not going to get smushed. The Excalibur Hotel there, behind it, the Luxor. The Luxor, if you're an engineering nut, you may enjoy, and you've never seen the inside of the Luxor. When you're done, you know, jot a note to look up YouTube videos of the inside. The uh, hotels are stacked in a pyramid shape, all the hotel rooms, on the outer wall. But underneath them, it's a completely column-free open atrium. And uh, it's weird. Like, you see it, hallways going up, you know, 20 stories or whatever for all these rooms in this open atrium and it's it, it's 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 amazing to see it's also a little bit uh terrifying <laughs> you go like oh man there's like nothing you sleep in your bed in your hotel room and you're suspended you know 200 feet above a, a gambling floor it's kind of kind of nuts but just the creativity that at one point Somebody sat down with investors and said, hey, I want to build a casino that looks like a knockoff of the, of the New York skyline. I mean, that's, this is wild, you know? And it's just, I don't know, it, to me it's, there's a lot of neat engineering everywhere in the world, but Las Vegas has plenty of it, plenty of their own. Well, while I'm walking, let's look at more chats. see oh I'm tripping on the cord here you guys still hear me 
What's with the clear, blurry streams? Sorry, hopefully it's looking better. Is it starting to blur up real bad? Let me know if, if the stream's starting to look bad. Oh, shoot. Well, any better or is it the data? Okay, well, if it, if it gets unacceptably bad, let me know and we could go ahead and wrap up. But, uh, um, okay, it's better. That's good. And there was uh, somebody, there was also somebody here I wanted to, gave some money I wanted to thank. No diggity 247. Thanks for the field trip. $23.45, which is incredibly generous of you. That's like actually go out to eat at like one of those restaurant type money. So like like others, thank you so much. Oh look, a roller coaster. I mean, do you imagine the any other city in America besides Las Vegas? You show up at a bank, say hi. I'm looking for investors in my project. Well, what is it you want to build, Mr. Uh, well, I'm thinking about building a casino hotel all right, that looks like the New York skyline and is surrounded by a, a roller coaster. No problem. We'll, we'll invest in it. <laughs> it's the audacity of it. Hey, do you plan on returning to Texas and covering the roads again? Yeah, at some point. In fact, I, I wanted to tease not just bikes a little bit because he has that video about how Houston sucks and so I was talking with Houston trying to say well okay it may suck now but like what are some things that the city's doing to try to make it better and kind of really get into like why Texas Houston turned out that way and it was kind of all set and then it got rained out and so I ended up shelving it for now but the others I, I kind of feel bad I don't want to antagonize them I you know he may he, he said he didn't do it because of me, but he made a video where he took one of my videos uh, about like hawk beacons and stuff and kind of just turned it inside out and said they were everything, everything, all my suggestions were terrible. Uh, and so he, and then I wrote him and, and you know, kind of apologized and said, hey, I, I know, sorry you hated everything I talked about. And he said, oh no, I wasn't even thinking about you. But I kind of feel like whatever that guy's doing, I, I don't want to, I don't want to make enemies, you know. He, he, he's, he's got some neat ideas. He just might be a little pious about it, that's all. But So I, I kind of shelved it, but it doesn't mean that I wouldn't make it back to Texas because I know down, downtown Dallas has that uh, concept of maybe deleting a freeway through downtown um, or putting it in a tunnel or who knows what. That's my train of thought here, but we are at the corner where you definitely don't want to walk that in, uh, in person. Now, the good news is they really make it impossible to cross this. What, what it's kind of difficult to see is that there's not just a fence there. There's actually a big grade change, like three feet. And you'd have to be really nuts to try to walk over that. And so they, they've done some neat features with landscaping and stuff to make it really clear that you're not to cross conventionally by just walking you know the, the wall is tall it's it's definitely now speaking of drains they do have it's interesting at the bottom of the wall here this would be a low spot where all the rainwater would collect so they've actually uh, cut the little holes there so that you're able to to get the rainwater to continue out and I'm assuming it goes out to the gutter and then there's a drain somewhere but uh, it's funny because uh, there's, there's still here the um, remnants of when people could cross the street. You have your ADA ramps there where um, they, they've cut the concrete low so you're able to roll up onto it. But obviously that's gone now because now you have these really grand pedestrian bridges that are more than just bridges. They're, they're actually uh, tied in with the buildings themselves. So you can sometimes exit the building and come straight across just real seamlessly from one property to the other. Um, but also have escalators to get you, and elevators to get you up to them. So let's, let's go for a ride on some of them. Let's, let's, let's go around the block. 
So this is on the uh, southwest corner. This would be the Excalibur. It's an MGM property. Uh, I think it's still MGM. A lot of the strips have been, uh, strip casinos have been selling their uh, properties and then leasing them back from investors who bought them. So I don't know if MGM still owns these, but on this corner you have New York, New York, which was also MGM, and then of course MGM, that's MGM. And then the lone holdout, kind of the mom and pop one, is uh, the Tropicana here, and uh, which is one of the few left where you can park for free. <laughs> but uh, the uh, Tropicana, you know, they, they're always talking about, well, if a baseball team were to come, where would they put the stadium? And there's rumors that they demolished the Rio, or one of them lately has been that they'd buy the business and sell on this. But, uh, but anyway, yeah, you have the main entrance of the Excalibur here, and then it goes straight across. And uh, it's probably a good size uh, crossing here. I'd probably, I'd say about 20 feet, at least 15 feet anyway. Um, you know, uh, to keep people from climbing, they have the uh, glass panels. It could be a plexiglass, actually. They look too nice to be plexiglass. I think they're actually they're actually double pane glass. But this this shows, despite um, what uh, not just bike says that crosswalks, uh, pedestrian sidewalk crosswalks are bad. Well, he's right in the sense that, yeah, if you wanted this to be a nice walkable village in the Netherlands, this, this is terrible, right? This is not the cozy little European town. But not everywhere is a cozy European town. Sometimes you end up building something that's just different. And Las Vegas is different. And for this huge intersection of Tropicana and Las Vegas Boulevard, the front door to all of these uh, strips, this, this is a pretty darn nice... Uh, nice way to cross it in, in comfort and to handle massive crowds. You know, this is uh, quite light for what you'd typically see on a Friday night, probably because it's cooler and, I don't know, I guess people, I would think people would want to come to Las Vegas for uh, uh, St. Patrick's Day, but, uh, you know, I've had times where I, I came and visited, it was so crowded that, you know, people end up like at a big subway station or something, you end up taking the stairs uh, because you don't want to wait in line to get on the moving sidewalk. I'd be interested to know if I ever had a chance to find the right document or talk, talk to the right person. They pulled the, the these uh, um, sky bridges back quite a ways from the uh, intersection you know rather than uh, having them right at the intersection elevator fan asks if there's an elevator and uh, yes there is there's also a cone no <laughs> does how does someone in a wheelchair cross well, let's check it out they do think of that because um, these are new enough that obviously the ADA is something that they're they're going to accommodate. We probably won't actually ride the elevator because uh, the uh, doing that, uh, I might lose the signal <laughs> and the door is shut. But we could check it out anyway. Tropic, uh, this uh, set of four crosswalks at Tropicana and uh, Las Vegas Boulevard, it's not a one-off either. Um, the Strip crosses several major crossings, I think there's about six or seven of them, and they all um, are getting to the point where they all have that. I think there's only one or two corners left. Yeah. Huge fan ears. Oh yeah? Here, hold on. Let's stay in the... Are you kind of... live streaming? Yeah. So you picked a Son good time. A What's your name? Kyle? Kyle. Hey, nice to meet you. you so this, this is Kyle. So what? So you've got a badge. What has you in town? Uh, Construction, construction Expo. You're from Lander, Wyoming? Lander, Wyoming, yes, sir. Get out. I've got cousins from Lander, no the Bills family. No way. You know them? Yeah, we went to their fire show growing up. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We went to work for them on their hill up there. Yeah, well, that's Green cool. Hill. 
So, so you're with precision dirt work. So, what yes, kind of sir. what kind of dirt work do you do? Residential excavation. We basements, up the mountains, basements, house dig outs, a little bit of road stuff here and there, concrete prep, all the above. Sewers. Have you seen what they do here in Cal California and Nevada when there's a new house? No. So I'm used to where I grew up, and I think Lander's the same way. You have your hill, right? And the street goes like this. You go to build your basement. So you you dig down and you kind of fill in and you pour your basement. Right. They'll take a perfectly good lot like this, and level the whole lot from edge to edge. And, and then in a subdivision, they'll do that from for 100 lots. And so you see a brand new subdivision, it's staircase, 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 because they don't excavate basements. They just put something, they just put a, because uh, footings don't have to go down that far, because right. there's no frost. Right. And so they'd rather just have a, a flat lot. It's nuts. I like the walkout basement. We have a walkout basement. We did our house. My dad built our house. So we got a walkout basement. It's really cool. Well, it's like having a second house because if you have a walkout basement, you can you double you double the size of your house and you right. uh, you end up with uh, more space. But uh, how long have you been watching? Oh, about a year. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. What, what what do you remember? What you clicked on that uh, the sucked in? The, the one with the roads, the lines that are crooked. And Hollister, the California. The, the mayor texted me like two days ago and said they finally fixed it, put okay. in all the little po bumpy poles and stuff. So uh, when it's not all flooded, I'll, I'll have to go see it again. That'll but, be awesome. uh, but yeah, we're we're doing a live stream. You're joining in with uh, 286 hey, uh, folks like you who. Uh, we went and saw, um, I assume you, being in town, do you have a rental car? Have you been driving around? Uh, actually, I live in Utah for going to school, so I just drove down. Okay. The, you, did you exit at Tropicana and see the big mess at that interchange there? I've, I've been looking at it from up there. Yeah. yeah. So that's where our field trip's been today. We've, okay. been, we've been going over all the fun uh, stuff that, you know, NDOT's been working on with that. Cool. And then uh, we had a choice. We could either go look at drains or uh, the strip, and I asked uh, friends on the chat here what they wanted to do, and it was like two thirds strip, one third drain. So we'll go to the drains next. But, cool. uh, so that's uh, that's cool. We got to run into yeah. you. So, so what was your big takeaway from your uh, conference so far? What oh, what man. did you what did you learn that you didn't know before? Well, there's incredible technology out there. There's all sorts of software to make things easier on the worker and the especially the boss too, to track hours, to move, all that cool GPS stuff to help things run smoother, be more precise. So you're talking like project management yeah, software? project management. But at the same time, we learned that we, we kind of were curious about it. We learned about it and we realized that's not the right, keep talking, it's not the right uh, equipment or it's not the right style for our type of work in town. So we, we learned about the cool stuff, but we really kind of just figured out that where we are at in our niche is where we're at. It wasn't worth spending $20,000 yeah, for a specialized software. Yeah, it's just not, it's not built for what we do. And so we came here, we saw a lot of equipment. We're looking for new equipment too. So we're looking between a John Deere and a bulldozer and a cat. Do they, is it like the auto show? Do they have like bulldozers parked yeah, inside there? They have equipment everywhere. It's wall to wall equipment. Oh just man. Incredible booth. So Caterpillar had a giant booth. Kamatsu had a big booth. John Deere had an incredible booth. Sandy, some Chinese brand, had an incredible booth too. Right. And so you, Caterpillar had a demo, demonstration. They had all their equipment out, doing cool stuff in the dirt. Bulba let us run around the equipment. They had to stack things on top of each other with a forklift. Oh, so really? So operated a loader good enough to do that. And if you did, you got a hat. So I got a hat doing that, which is oh, fun. Oh, congrats. It's really hands-on, all sorts of crazy equipment. Really, really cool. Well, that's that's neat. Well, I'm, yeah. re I'm really happy uh, you were able to, yeah. to, to flag me down. Yeah, well, good to meet you. Nice to meet you, Kyle. Yeah. Enjoy your field trip. Yeah, you too. Well, that's fun. That's fun. So it was uh, being able to to the Hollister video with the zigzaggy road that he, he spotted it. But uh, anyway, um, we're here with an elevator. <laughs> see, I just see if I miss any. Uh, let's see if I say hi, Kyle. Okay, so um, yeah, this is an elevator. So this would be the ADA accommodation. Uh, for being able to get across the bridge. So there is definitely, and it, uh, and it says here, the elevator access to the four corners. And I like this little touch they did here too, where they have uh, uh, glass. You know, a lot of times transit elevators, you know, at a train station and stuff, it's kind of a nasty enclosed thing. And this looks very clean, you know, I mean, she was just in there cleaning it. 
and, and it makes sense. There's probably a lot of private money because uh, you know these large, you know, billion-dollar facilities that rely on uh, a good guest experience. But uh, but yeah, so that would be uh, so it'd be cheaper to give every wheelchair person a free taxi ride anywhere they wanted. I don't think you take into. I mean, I, I appreciate the humor. I don't think, and I hope I don't lose you in here. Um, I don't think you take into account just how nuts these uh, bridges normally are. They're, they're not normally, you normally wouldn't have the elevator to yourself uh, like you do right now. Um, they can just be packed on the weekends. This is very, very abnormal for a Friday. Um, you, can, you come two months from now, oh my gosh, my kids are out of school. This place would just be wall to wall people trying to, to sell things. I mean, it's it's wild. Oh, I says, I'm being humorous. Elevator service contracts are horrendous, horrendously expensive. I see them at train stations and they get used like twice a day. Yeah, it's, I, I don't even begin to know. You pick up the phone and you call Otis or uh, what's the German one? But uh, <laughs> what type of a check you got to cut down to, to that that does sound like a niche, though. If somebody wanted to get into it, you know, if you could be an apprentice for an elevator repair technician, you'd have a really steady work. Well, if I didn't lose you going indoors, um, I'd be really tempted to take you guys on a monorail. But uh, oh, I missed a couple of super chats. Okay, let's pull over and, and pull over and do that. Yes, thank you for the reminder. I don't want to. I definitely don't want to leave out. I, I, I feel bad skipping any of you as I, as I do, just because uh, I, I, re I tried on the first live stream in San Francisco to uh, answer every single one. And then it got so far behind that uh, my friend had to send me an actual text to say, like, hey, you got to get caught up. You're like 30 minutes behind. <laughs> And so now I'm the other way around where I feel bad or I'm scrolling past all kinds of chats. But definitely don't want to miss super chats because people, you know, if you're, if you're a person who, like me, you don't, you don't have a lot of cash, but you really like some content and you want to help pay for it, that's fantastic, you know. And uh, so I want to make sure I acknowledge every single one. So, well, yeah, once again, JSBN123 with the 2569. It's a double double. Thanks again, Jesse D with the five dollars. No diggity. Thanks for the field trip. Twenty three dollars. Let's see. Spencer Mosier writes. Uh, At least on the cheap side, go check out Gr Fish and Chips or Burger. If you go to Pub and Grill, get the Beef Wellington. Way better than In Out. Okay. I mean that's, that sounds more up my alley than I love fish and chips. Uh, more up my alley than. Uh, the, the, the problem with like a Gordon Ramsay type place is that I, I, I didn't grow up around that kind of food. <laughs> and so I, I sit down at the table and I, I go, oh, I, I, I know this is really fancy and I should be savoring it, but I don't know what it is I'm supposed to be savoring. And so I feel like I'm not truly getting good value out of the experience compared to somebody who really knows food, you know. So I will, uh, gee, gee, can I do a... Well, I don't want to risk messing the stream up, but I was going to say, I'll try to take a picture of that. J GR Fish and Chips. Um, bu -bu 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 -bu. What's my favorite book? That's not a super chat, but I'm not really a book guy. I, I, I read Bob Schieffer, who was a reporter at CBS News, had a book about what I couldn't tell you on TV. And it was kind of neat, like behind the scenes of what it was like to... Uh, uh, work in CBS News back in like the 70s and 80s, you know, the golden age of CBS News. It was, was kind of interesting, but I haven't really read a lot of books since then. Uh, Jane Jacobs, The Life and Death of Great American Cities is a good read, but even she retracted a lot of her stuff as she got older, because basically she wrote a book and said, uh, Brooklyn of the 1940s was the best. Also, I grew up in Brooklyn in the 1940s. <laughs> so, I've, but, uh, Let's see. Oh my, a big one here. $49.99. Buy Kyle a drink or something. Oh crap, I should have. Oh well, he looked like he got places to be. I would, uh, 
But I, I could find out. Uh, oh shoot, what was his last name? But he knew my he knew my uh, relatives. It's a small town up there. Let's see. You missed a couple of super chats. Yeah, I think I'm, I'm getting caught up. Thyssen Krupp. Yes, I think there's like another one that was. Thyssen Krupp was the elevator company that's German. We're getting really off track here. Casino is probably a free Wi-Fi monorail. Well, maybe there's a way I can like get down to the sidewalk. We can at least see the outside of the monorail. Who is your dentist, Rob? Beautiful smile. Um, actually, you know how Kyle was talking about how he knew my cousins? My uncle, who he's since passed away, but he was a little bit nuts. He not only did he do like big fireworks shows for fun, he made his money by being a really good orthodontist. So you can thank him, my, my late uncle, who straightened my teeth. They were a disaster. Um, since Kyle left, you can use my donation to antagonize, not just Mike's in a future video. Well, all right, when I get down to Texas, maybe the chicken needs to go for the same walk that uh, not just Bikes did when he tried to buy his luggage and claimed it was impossible. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, what's your favorite traffic engineering textbook? Oh, you know, I, I've got a soft spot for the uh, uh, MUTCD. Like, the MUTCD. The MUTCD is fun to just pop open, and let's, let's talk while I'm walking to the monorail. We can walk and talk at the same time. I'm going to, in fact, let me put this away in my backpack so my hands are free. The, the MUTCD, you know, when I was a little kid, my mom made a book for me of, like, I not just road signs, but it was like business logos and stuff she'd cut out of the newspaper back, you know, in the 1980s. And... Um, I would just stare at that, all the, the little logos and stuff. And, and I think a lot of people who like transportation really have a soft spot for the signs. The signs are like iconic brands that we grow up with, but unlike even McDonald's who over time changes their brand, um, you, you have uh, these road signs that really don't change for decade after decade, they, they look the same. You know, the sign that says right lane must turn right um, looks the same as it did when I was a kid, you know, 30, 30 35 years ago. And so um, being able to just, I don't know, have that kind of like comforting thing of like in a changing world where AI is going to put us all out of work and climate change is disrupting transportation and our way of life and having to address how well, we're going to power our cities and what we're going to do for work and how we're going to afford housing and all this stuff that's changing. There's something weird about like, but the sign still says right lane must turn right the way it used to, you know, when I was a kid. It, it, it's like seeing an old friend. And so, I don't know, getting in the MUTCD and flipping through all the signs can be, it can be a lot of fun, you know, I, I don't know. So we got a little bit of a walk here. We're gonna walk down to a street that parallels Las Vegas Boulevard. Las Vegas Boulevard's behind us, and the street's called Koval, K-O-V-A-L, and that's the street that the monorail, a big chunk of the monorail runs along. And uh, so we'll go walk down to, it's not this first signal. The first signal is, I think, the driveway to the MGM parking garage, but the, uh, the second signal a little farther down and uh, famously, Koval was the street, I think, where uh, I think Tupac got shot about a block or two from here. So, you know, not that that's uh, really relevant to transportation, but uh, Schindler Elevator, yes, that's what it was. Okay, let me see if I can get caught up. MUTCD, you're walking away from the monorail. No, turn around, take the monorail. I'm walking toward the outside of the monorail. So I'm not, I'm not going inside because I'm afraid I'm going to lose you guys. <laughs> but, uh, and I don't know how MGM feels about live streaming in the middle of their building. They probably are fine with it. But. Adam wishes everybody a happy St. Patrick's Day. And if you think about it, I'm wearing both green and orange, which means I'm representing the entire island for good or for bad. <laughs> so happy St. Patrick's Day to Catholics and Protestants alike. Thank heaven for the Good Friday Agreement. Okay, um, so this is the main entry for MGM. And then to get to the monorail, 
we go past it. So this could be a time to read more of your chats. Do not, did not expect Tupac trivia from Road Guy Rob. Well, you know, he sings a lot about LA and LA has roads, so therefore, I mean, oh, it's green, I better wait. I'm also in Nevada where the, uh, technically jaywalking is still ticketable, right? So, <laughs> okay, let's see. Savvy wishes also a happy St. Patrick's Day. Not on Reddit, unfortunately, didn't know where it is. Come to the coast of Mississippi. We've been installing crazy road infrastructure. What, uh, uh, Kent of Mississippi, what uh, towns in particular? Because I can, if you give me something specific to look at, I'll pin it on my map. I don't know when I'll get there, but at least if I have it on the map, I can, uh, I can have a chance to, to see it. I've forgotten how far down this walk is. It, this, this does lend credibility to the urban planners who talk about we build cities that, yeah, even if we put in all the pedestrian infrastructure like we should, this is a nice, it got to be like a 10-foot sidewalk, at least 8-foot. Um, it's still just a long walk. <laughs> and so you notice that back at the strip where things were a little more closer together, there were a lot of pedestrians, but the farther away I'm getting from it, you know, the harder it is. The actual monorail entrance is inside MGM, but the uh, actual monorail itself, well, you'll see it here in a minute. I'm almost to, well, I thought this was Koval, but the sign says something else. Anyway. Let's see. Um, not on Reddit, unfortunately. Happy St. Patrick's Day. Sent you a Patreon message. Still need an interview from the Carmel Mayor. Yes, Jack, thank you. I, I, uh, I saw your email. I, I apologize if I haven't replied to it. I, what happens is I use my email as a to-do list. And if I reply, it gets marked as read. So I go, oh, I'll write, I'll write him back tomorrow, and then I can start putting some things together. And then I get busy, and then I feel bad because then I'm replying much later than, than you deserve. Because I, I do appreciate that a month ago you reached out to me with that. So I, I'm not going to Indiana imminently, but I anticipate going to Indiana this year. So I will definitely want to be in touch. Um, I just don't want to uh, get the you know, pe people all ramped up and excited thinking that, oh yeah, Rob's ready to come out and do a story right away and, and showcase all the roundabouts and then say, yeah, but it might not be till like, you know, a couple months from now or, or the summer, you know, so, but I will definitely, because I, I, I think, I, I've never seen a city in America anyway that just committed, that just said, all right, we're doing this, we're, we're going to be a a roundabout town, you know. <laughs> but uh, let's see. Do you think the road is too wide? Oh, this road here? Um, for what it's designed to be? No. Tropicana is a really major east-west thoroughfare. And if you have land use that is spread out, that requires driving, you have to provide infrastructure to handle it. Oh, here's the first part of the... Look at that. There it is. The first bit of the monorail there. So it doesn't, it must turn before it gets to uh, Koval. So let's go, uh, let's go down this street. You know, if, 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 if we're gonna commit to making an area more walkable, we could talk about making the street narrower and things. Cause the, the goal is you need to be able to get to the economic activity that you wanna do you can't just say, oh, oh, look, it's coming. There it is. There it is. So there's the Las Vegas monorail. This is the side that actually works. So this part, you actually buy a ticket. It's totally automated. It runs, I don't think it's quite 24 hours, but it runs to like, at least before the pandemic, it would run till like three or four in the morning. 
and uh, it's really good going to the uh, big Las Vegas um, Convention Center. I think that's why the Convention and Visitors Bureau bought it, because you'll never be able to provide enough parking at the big convention center. Las Vegas is a town full of convention spaces. I mean, even this one here has that sign that says something about Signature Conference Center. And so every single hotel has big conventions that go to it. But the really big conventions, you know, like the, the Consumer Electronics Show and stuff, <coughs> where you get tens of thousands of people coming, the Las Vegas um, Convention Center is probably one of the few places in the country that can handle those big shows. There it goes, right overhead. Yeah, look at that. Well, let's follow it, see where it goes. Make sure I don't get hit by a car. I'm not sure where the sidewalk is where I'm supposed to be. Oh, shoot. I picked a very bad time to be stranded. Now we'll wait for everybody to drive around me. I was so excited. I wasn't really paying attention to what I was doing. Okay. You guys had the same issue. <laughs> Okay, so it looks like the, the monorail platform is actually right over here. Oh, let's see what it takes to get over there. I don't want to walk all the way around like that. Yeah, that stub has a switch for swapping trains the other track. Yeah, this is the tail end of it. It wouldn't be that difficult to have it just keep going and then it would go end up at the airport. It's a good, this is the, uh, uh, you know, it's a quality garbage for anybody else. Let me see if I switch the camera a couple times, does that make it any better? Yeah, well, hopefully it clears up here. That's my, my fear is, it, yeah. so. Adam mentions maybe not just bikes and strong towns can help rezone cities and suburbia. Well, it's not going to take advocates. Advocates draw attention to an idea. It's actually trying to convince people. People are the ones who vote in city council members and state legislators who influence policy. And so we kind of collectively have to agree that we're, oh, no access to the monorail. <laughs> well, that's too bad. You do have to access it from the inside, apparently. We can still look at it at least. That must be an emergency exit or something. And so, yeah, I mean, if you if we want to commit to really changing the way our cities are and being less car dependent, but trade off most people not being able to afford yards and things, we can do it. Maybe we should do it. But we got to get people warmed up to the idea because ultimately people who vote and live in it, it's their tax dollars, it's their spending, it's their property. You know, and I, and I think just simply yelling at people and saying, well, you're not being altruistic. We need to do this for the sake of whatever. That's not a great way to go. So this is what's frustrating. The entrance to the monorail is right over that fence, but I have to go through the hotel to get there. <laughs> Pete, Martin, uh, Pete Mar Marin points out maybe it will help alleviate housing prices. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm at a point where I would love to buy, because I couldn't afford to buy anything else, I would love to buy something that's like a glorified hotel room. Like, you know, you ever stay at one of those extended stay places and they've got like the little kitchenette, and then it's kind of like you've got a desk where you can do work, and a bed, and a shower, and a toilet, and everything, you know. And I'm like, if I could buy one of those for like, I don't know, $80,000, land included, you know, on a little tiny lot, and then um, finance it over 30 years, that would be a nice starter home for me that could have been, let me build up equity and, and kind of rent control myself with a mortgage payment. 
and, and buy into it. And the neat thing is that sort of a thing really lends itself to high density. You know, I don't need a quarter acre for something that's 300 square feet. Um, so this is sidewalk just ends. So we have to go to the other side. But uh, I'm really far away from my car at this point. <laughs> I don't know how you cross here. Now this is where you get into an area that never has pedestrians, so they don't think about pedestrians. And so as a result, it's kind of lousy to be a pedestrian. Even with the stop sign here, it's a Tesla, it'll break for me, right? Okay, let's look at uh, uh, Paper Mints writes, yeah, same here, like a studio or a dorm style. Yeah, I mean, I'm at a point where I'd like to have a space that if things worked out, like, you know, with, with, with a girl or something and, you know, I got married or whatever, I have a place to get started, but then I can later sell and get a bigger place if I ever had kids. But I just never can get that leg into the first place. And there's no point playing the rental game because the rent just skyrockets. And uh, I, you know, and I, I, I don't need some luxury apartment. I just want some, like a little glorified studio thing that I could buy. Okay, we need to head to the drains before the sunset. And say, yeah, that's a good idea. Okay, I got to figure out how to. But anyway, that's the monorail. And if I, I'd go for a ride on it, but I don't know how to get on it. So now let's figure out how to get back to. What's the, to Las Vegas Boulevard. Okay, this might be my MGM Garden Center. Does that go through? Okay, well, let's see if we can walk and talk here. Let's see if we can get to the drains before the sun sets. Okay. Whew. You ever notice that you work in an office? How really out of shape you get. Okay, what do we got going here? Cop uh, hit his lights, but for no reason. I'm not sure. Rob, honestly, your best bet is to just go back the way you came. Uh, probably. Shoot. Well, I'm committed now. I know this goes through though, because there are cars. So I, I know there's a way through, even if I have to walk through the building. I mean, I can see the strip, like it's right, it's right there, you know, so I'm almost back. But uh, it's, a, it's the, the whole uh, trope about like, are you gonna ask for directions? Like, you know, <laughs> Okay. The downside with the time change is that, well, it's not a downside, I guess it's an upside, is the live stream's going even longer than last time because the sun's not going dark. Oh. They wish they had one of those little scooters they could rent. I see a stoplight. That's a good sign. Kind of interesting. This is the, it's like being on a Hollywood back lot. You get to see the back side of the show and everybody's on the front side where they're staying in nice hotel rooms and fancy restaurants and stuff. But this, this is the real Las Vegas <laughs> where, people, where people get work done, you know? No sidewalk though. I guess there is one on the other side, but almost there. We're almost back to the street. Okay. Okay, we'll read some chance. Road guy Robert getting in his cardio today. You have no idea how bad a shape the pandemic got me. Did you have the same thing happen? Did you find that you were in like reasonable office shape in 2019. In fact, 2019, I was actually doing some construction work. I was in pretty good shape and uh, it was great. I was losing weight and then the pandemic hit and I went back to doing office type work. 
and uh, now I'm bushed. Uh, let's see, does, does Las Vegas have a bike or scooter rental on every block? Unfortunately, no. I haven't seen a single scooter in this town, and I really could use one right now, but I understand why. We're about to get to the boulevard here, and this is starting to look more normal, where you really don't have the space to ride a bike or a scooter because uh, you just hit people. And so that's probably why they don't have it. Imagine, can you only imagine Brute Road guy on a scooter holding a camera? I could do it. If I can eat a cheeseburger while shifting a manual transmission and not getting in a major collision, I can do anything, right? Okay. But you kind of see, like, this is why they don't have a pedestrian, the, the, this is why they don't have the uh, bikes, uh, rental bikes, is you just have a uh, pedestrian volume density. It's interesting. Engineers for roads use level of service where they look at the, the amount of cars on the road or the type of delay because roads have a maximum number of cars per hour they can handle before they start failing and you start having delay. And if you Google pedestrian level of service, you learn about big, big cities in Asia, in Europe, in New York that have crushing volumes of uh, pedestrian traffic and so they actually have level of service that they, they have to deal with and this is probably one of the only places on the west coast where you have enough pedestrian volume at times where there'd actually be delay everybody's looking back well good i fit in with spongebob and everybody else right maybe i can see if anybody wants to take a photo with me <laughs> Let's see. I'm just trying to read. Where'd the comments go? Come back, comments. Oh, there they go. If New York City ha can have a bicycle network, so can Las Vegas. That's true. Um, you know, it's right there. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, but the uh, main difference is so much of this is powered off of one road. So, yeah, if you could, there's room. There's no doubt you could put in a bikeway or something, but that bikeway would would be barriered off where it wouldn't you wouldn't be able to just dart your bike in anywhere you wanted over here. And they'd have to be very strict about making sure that the, the bikes stay out where they're supposed to, that they're not hanging out where the pedestrians are. Because the last thing you want is somebody deciding, okay, I got my rental bike. I'll go ahead and ride it where the pedestrians are and you start creating, you know, then they start creating safety problems, you know. <laughs> so, I don't know if you noticed that uh, when we were at the previous corner, there's another sky bridge down there. Just to show you that there is a uh, network of sky bridges. It's, not, again, not just this corner uh, with the four bridges. Let's see. It's almost 9.40 p.m. where I are. Uh, what about you, Rob? Um, obviously, don't feel obligated to hang on. It's wonderful uh, that you uh, decided to spend your St. Patrick's Day hanging out and looking at bridges and talking about freeway interchanges and monorails and things we weren't planning on. So I'm not gonna be offended if, if this drops, drops off to 20 people, I'm, I'm not gonna feel bad you know I do think I, I do want to go over and look at that drain plus I gotta get back to my car anyway and it's over there but uh, so I'll hang on for a little while um, but yeah you're welcome you know anybody's it's YouTube you're welcome to jump off I lost all my money at the casino so at least I'm having fun watching Rob hey and you guys are keeping me out of a casino although I'm gonna take statistics you know I say well Rob how come you don't gamble and I say well because if I ever gamble, 
I'm going to make a game and then the casino can come to my house and play my game. Because <laughs> it's, it's a long game, right? It's just playing probability. You have a, you know, even like a roulette wheel or something. You say, oh, well, that's 50-50. It's not because you have those two green squares. It's 48-52 in favor of the house. So a lot of people will win a lot of money. But overall, as you run thousands and thousands and thousands of bets, the house wins 52% of the money. It's, it's just, that's just how it works. And so at that point, I'm saying, yeah, once you understand probability and you realize there's not, not even anything such as 50-50, then uh, I go, well, why would I play? <laughs> I'd rather just keep my money and, you know, go, go eat. Eating, you win every time with eating. Just ask my doctor. She said, I'm winning too much. I hit my all-time score at the doctor's the other day. 196 pounds. I still have 160 on my driver's license. I, I like that. Gambling's malware bot rights. Gambling's a real gamble, though. <laughs> oh, that's true. Food poisoning does as a... Uh, JSB123 points out, food poisoning is kind of like losing, you know, the house winning. Um, well, it's kind of like both the house and I win, lose. Savvy writes, I'm here all the way, even though my wife thinks I'm weird. Let's see, oh, comment went away. Come back, ah, <laughs> come back, chat. Why? Is there a way on YouTube to make this, like the chat stay on? I have to keep, there we go. I'm here all the way, even though my wife thinks I'm weird, but she doesn't do driving, does she? Yeah, exactly. I, I once heard a traffic engineer say at an ITE lunch, he was saying that they got like complaints from people who regular road users and stuff. And, uh, he said, everybody thinks they're a traffic engineer. He said it very cynically. But you know, I think he's right, but for the wrong reason. He was cynical about it, and I'm not. Everybody kind of is a traffic engineer. You know, you have a, um, think about any other type of engineering, like think about sewer engineering. If we every single day spent 20 minutes to an hour goofing around with our septic and sewer systems, we'd all be pretty good at sewer engineering, at, at fluid dynamics, at, you know what I mean? Because we have so much real world experience with the thing. And if cars, someday when they drive themselves, um, a lot of people won't understand uh, traffic engineering that well because uh, they won't be doing the driving. But right now we all have to do the driving. So every day for 20 minutes to an hour or more, we are test beta testers of transportation infrastructure and we get a chance to see what works and what doesn't. And a lot of our, a, lot, a common driver who has uh, no uh, engineering experience whatsoever can have some pretty good insight into what's working and what's not. Sometimes they, they come up with remedies that wouldn't work. You know, you always hear people say like, that freeway interchange is all messed up. They ought to replace it with a roundabout. Well, you're not gonna be able to replace a freeway interchange with a roundabout, you know? <laughs> you do have to have something that can accommodate that level of traffic volume. But, but at the same time, you, uh, you still have people who are really good at pointing out, yeah, this freeway interchange doesn't work. They can be really good at even pointing out the reason it doesn't work is because the one exit's on the left and the one entrance is on the right and everybody's trying to change four lanes. Well, they just described a weaving section. So I, I don't take it cynically at all. I think the more the profession can have that attitude with full sincerity of, yeah, everybody thinks they're a traffic engineer. That's great because then you can empower drivers to give you feedback and you know more than you than you knew before. Um, let's see, 70s Disco King writes, I had a gambling problem once, had to call that hotline, and when they asked me what my problem is, I said, I got three and the dealer's showing seven. 
Let's see. I love botch dots. We do a video about the Interstate 84 and 91 interchange in Hartford. Oh, yeah, I'm trying to think. I, Hartford, I just remember, I can't remember that interchange specifically because I, I did get to drive it last January, uh, a year ago. All I remember is that whatever it was, it worked, but it had a lot of, well, what we were just describing of like, well, this exit's on the left, but this one's on the right, and a lot of fast lane changing, or I think once I missed, excuse me, missed my ramp. Is there something in, in particular, if you don't mind replying in the chat, what it is, I'll add it to the pin. If I, I have a cousin who lives in, near Hartford, so I may get back out there again. Um, I recommend Interstate 66 Express Lanes uh, for those of you near DC. Is there something, yeah, Express Lanes in general are quite interesting because of, well, you can, there's like only so wide you can make a freeway before you have so many lane changes that people, uh, everybody's braking to accommodate everybody's lane change and then it like, cancels out the wide freeway. And so the express lanes are cool because one, you can separate them off so they're like their own different freeways so you can get another lane or two. They pay for themselves supposedly because instead of having to spend a lot of money replacing bridges and widening the freeway and spend a lot of money, with just tax revenue to pay for it, you can make a portion of that be toll revenue to pay it back. And then you can use variable price tolling to keep the lanes moving. So if too many drivers are using those lanes and slowing it down, you can, uh, um, you can have uh, uh, the price just incrementally go up to price enough people out to keep them moving. So it's, it's a fun tool. Um, is there something in particular about the 66 ones, though, that you'd, you'd want to point out? If you want to add that, I'll, I'll, like I say, I'm going to go through all these chats and save it with pins and things. So later, because what will inevitably happen is I'm going to have, this has happened several times, a cousin or somebody say, hey, I'm moving. Can you help me? Uh, um, <coughs> I'm moving. Can you help me? Uh, I'll show you the roller coaster here. So I think I hear it. There it is. Where'd it go? Um, anyway, they'll say, I'm moving, Rob. Can you help me uh, with uh, moving, you know, driving the U-Haul? And I, I love to drive a big truck. So I'll say, sure, because I can bring my camera along and film stories for you while I'm there. So um, what will happen is uh, it'll be somewhere I won't expect. Like, hey, I'm moving right. to Connecticut. And so if I have that pin board ready to go, I can look on there and say, oh yeah, here are three things people pointed out I had to look at while I'm in Connecticut. And then that gives me the ability to, to do the traveling and, and see that. So um, yeah, definitely uh, anything is specific too, you know, not just the project, but if there's something that really bugs you about it or that you really like about it, I, let me know, I'll add it to the pin. Let's see, I definitely love a merch shop. Um, okay, so here's what's going on in the merch shop. Technically, if you go to roadguyrob.com, you can see the beta site that I've been working on. I have a sister who does web design and she's been helping me with it. I'm trying to make it so that if you contribute on Patreon, any amount, the videos are there ad-free. So you just sign in with your Patreon, hopefully it'll work, and then watch the videos. So if you really enjoy it and don't want to put up with YouTube, it's there. I'll probably even get where I'll post them there a couple days at, a couple days early. It's just it is a way of thanking, because the truth, the, the Patreons who month after month contribute, you know, a, a buck or two or five or 10 or 20 or whatever, consistently, they, they're the ones who really make it possible for me to eat and survive enough to do this, to, to, to keep chasing these stories. So I like to, I want to give them something, you know, I, I, I don't make enough to like send them mugs and stuff. So at least the least I could do is at least try to give them an ad free experience. So that's going on right now. And then the very, very like alpha version of a merch store the the I'm trying to figure out the way merch stores work, I guess, is that I'm learning all this. Um, you use a third party company who manufactures it and then they kind of deal with the returns and stuff. And I'm caught between 
one merch store called uh, Teespring that has a lot of neat options of things I can add, but a few people complain that the t-shirts would like fade after a lot of washes. And then there's other merch stores where the t-shirts are maybe built a little bit better, but then there's nothing else. Like you can't get mugs or clipboards or whatever. So that's partly why I've been slow uh, dealing with that. Hold on just a second. I didn't want to bug the guy who was sleeping. But uh, um, so that's, that's the challenge right now is uh, do I go for something that gives you more options and things to buy, but maybe you'd be disappointed in the quality or do I have where you can only get t-shirts, but then maybe it's built better. So, and I don't know, I don't buy merch. So this is all new to me, but, uh, but it is happening. So, and right now, technically there are two terrible test items on roadguyrob.com in the merch store um, that are really terrible items that nobody in their right mind would buy <laughs> that I just put in there to test. But, uh, oh, hey, real quick, I'm going over. This is not um, Dean Martin Drive. This is the other one on the uh, strip side. But this is what it'll be like on the uh, west side of the, the non-strip side of the freeway when the bridge is done. I'm crossing Tropicana again, where the street will just go underneath. Um, but it'll be on both sides and that intersection we looked at two and a half hours ago that'll be uh that'll be gone okay let's see some more chats las vegas needs uh, a continuous sidewalk separated bike lanes raised crosswalks reduced car lanes i don't know a town that is so dependent on people driving from all over to come spend money in their state. I'll be honest, I don't know that reducing car lanes is a good idea, but it doesn't mean, but there's space, right? We have room that we can do all the other stuff. Reducing car lanes is a good trade-off in a, a dense downtown where there's not a lot of space. And you go, honestly, this is downtown. Everybody should be walking. Um, we, we only have, you know, 75 feet to work with. Let's take a car lane away in each direction for pedestrian stuff. That, may, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I'm not sure here. I, 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 I think if, if Las Vegas is going to abandon its auto-centric ways, oh, sorry, I thought it was my turn and it's not. Um, it's gonna do it gradually. You have casinos that are a couple billion dollars a pop spread out on a long strip and so i'm, I'm kind of more and i'm of an opinion adding new things to make it easier to walk first and then as that succeeds start gradually taking the car stuff away because i think the, uh, the the strip casinos would riot if you tried to start taking the car stuff away they want more because their their goal is to get, they want money in there you know however they get here now, what could change it is if you've been following uh, in the news that Brightline train, it's not full high-speed rail, but it's, it's kind of a, a speedy Amtrak type train, but it's not Amtrak. It's, I think it's gonna be similar to like a Sela. Hey, it's my turn now, huh? Um, that Brightline train does have uh, kind of a memorandum of understanding with uh, the state of California to run its track down the middle of uh, the I-15 median through the Mojave Desert, which is gonna be really weird. Because you, you drive, if you've ever driven through the Mojave Desert between LA and Las Vegas, it's busy, but you really feel like you're in the old west, cactus and sagebrush and dry, 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 you know? And uh, to have this zippy train that looks really modern running in the media and that's going to be really weird but i think really cool and once that train's in place you add in expanding the monorail start adding a lot of these features you're talking about about uh, buffered bike lanes and and more pedestrian stuff connecting to the uh, tr train station um that's how that's how you begin you start by adding 
And then once you've added enough stuff, maybe if you start taking some things away, people won't really notice because they don't really miss it. You know? Well, okay, well, we made it this far. We're back to old choppy here. So now we gotta cross this free left turn with no, no walk signal. You just gotta go for it. So we stop. We really look to make sure nobody's coming and they are coming. So I'm gonna wait, because I don't, well, maybe if I go fast. Nobody in the left lane. Okay, now somebody's in. Catch 22, right? The minute I try to walk, yeah, somebody's gonna make their left, get on the freeway. So. I mean, technically they're supposed to wait for me, but they can't see me because the pole kind of blocks their view of me. And also, again, you, you wait. I mean, you saw how bad that traffic was on Tropicana as I walked up here. You wait in a nasty traffic jam like that, and finally you get a chance to get on the freeway and get out of there. You don't want to wait for a pedestrian. You're just going to go, you know. And so that's where you really have to, if they're serious about safety here, they'd add a pedestrian walk signal. But I mean, considering the traffic light temporary, I, I'm just, that's I should just be grateful for what we got, but. You know, somebody sent me an email probably about uh, a couple months ago about a diverging diamond project, a permanent one that was going in in, I want to say it's Mississippi. I think I, I put a pin on it in the pin board. And the reason he pointed it out is there was no pedestrian accommodation. A brand new freeway interchange and they didn't even bother putting any sidewalks in. Because as you remember with those diverging diamond interchanges, the debate normally is do you put the sidewalk down the middle or do you put them on the two of them on the edges? They had nothing, <laughs> absolutely nothing. And I, I think it was a brand new bridge. I don't remember if it was a retrofit or if they're building a new bridge, but it was just pitiful. And so I went to Google Maps and I put in, okay, I'm walking. I want to walk from one side of the freeway to the other, which should be like a 10 minute walk. And uh, it sent me a mile or two miles down to like the next exit where I could cross over the sidewalks that were there and then like two miles back. And I'm saying, nobody's going to walk four miles. And really how much money, I mean, I, I, I could see people saying like, well, nobody walks anyway, so we're going to, We'll save money. It'll, it'll save money by not putting in the sidewalk. But hypothetically, if you had enough people walk, like, you know what I mean? Like, I, I don't know, to me, that's not where you want to cut the corner. Like, like you should at least be able to, you should be at least be able to walk there, you know? <laughs> it, was, it drove me crazy about uh, Dallas was uh, how, it was like Dallas had grown so fast they didn't slow down enough to uh, actually put in any sidewalks. So some, some neighborhoods did, but like some neighborhoods had sidewalks on one side, but not the other. And then uh, the big collector streets that gathered all the traffic together, they'd done a really good job at widening it out. Sometimes they'd even put a curb in, but then they had uh, no sidewalk next to the curb. But you knew people walked because you could see where the grass was dead because people had been walking, you know? And so, I. I I, I don't know, I just, I just, I can't imagine that pay, putting in the sidewalk, even a terrible three foot sidewalk, really costs that much more, you know? I, I don't know. There, there's a reasonable middle ground, you know? Okay, let me get caught back up with the chat here. Let's see. Do, do, do. Freeway spec roundabouts. Oh yeah, we were talking about that a while ago. Let me get down to the bottom and I'll work my way up. Found out that the town I live in was originally founded as a special tax district to pay for sidewalks. That's interesting, yeah. I mean, that, that, that's the, the hard part. Everything needs money. You know, it's, I, I think we forget how expensive infrastructure is to build. 
you know, this drop a can of project that's one big bridge deck and then half a flyover and a frontage road underneath, you think, well, how bad could that be? That's $300 million. You know, and that's one freeway interchange, you know. And so it, it, it's, it's a major commitment to getting, to getting it right. But, yeah, you know, something like sidewalks and stuff, like I, I think you just, you just gotta bake it into the project and just say, well, it's just, you wanna build a neighborhood in our, our community, you gotta put the sidewalks in. Like, it, like even, a, even a bad, like this is not a good sidewalk. This one is one, well, I guess it's five foot, one, two, four foot, four foot sidewalk. I think I've seen them as small as three, but I'll tell you what, I'd rather have a four foot sidewalk than no sidewalk. Okay, so here's where there's drainage that goes underneath the freeway, and I'll try to give some privacy to the person who's living here and not shoot his tent, but, um, but basically, they run a storm channel underneath the freeway, but as you can see, uh, Dean Martin Drive is right here. It'll be going right over the top of us. In fact, let's, we get the angle from the other side. And so they've really got to get in and play around with, with these, uh, with the way these drains work because uh, this this isn't going to work being here anymore and you know it, it's kind of funny because my gut instinct with las vegas is well it's dry why do you have to worry about water and the answer is well you normally don't but when you do you really do <laughs> you know it's, that's why you just see this really i mean think about how many cubic feet per minute could each one of those big channels carry and there's what three four of them you know so it's not an insignificant amount so you can see down there on dean martin drive that's uh, allegiant stadium where the uh former oakland team plays and then it's going to go straight across the the channel here and so that's where they got to do some work on it because that'll just keep going straight underneath the the underpass and then i think that the turnout this road will still go up there to make those rights you know right in right out now the stoplight here with a little road that ties uh says this will go straight and then it'll have a stoplight that'll come up to this road so it'll it'll be a corner here instead um let's see personally hate diverging diamond on e470 in denver it has taken me 20 minutes 20 for me in the morning every day well yeah i mean a di diverging diamond it's, it's not that the diverging diamond is bad it's that you only get so much capacity in, in any interchange the, you know this diverging diamond over here is failing badly but it's working a heck of a lot better than if it was a regular half diamond you know so that's what's hard i i have to laugh cal you talk about level of service we were talking about that earlier how they can measure how crowded a road is, how much delay there is for a driver, and then they give it a letter grade, A, B, C, D, E, F. And they usually shoot for C. C is it's crowded, but it's working. D, E, and F is where it starts failing. And there's a freeway project in California where they're spending a whole bunch of money where the 60 and 91 freeways meet. It's two freeways merged together, go through a canyon together, and then split back apart. And it's awful. And they are spending a whole bunch of money, and when it's done, it's still going to be a grade letter, level of service, F. But it's going from being an F3, apparently. It can fail so bad it becomes F1, F2, F3. It's going to go from an F3 to an F1, and that's enough reduction in delay that it's worth spending millions of dollars. And uh, the, I think it's the same thing here, where a, a diverging diamond here is failing but it's failing less than the other alternative they had which is a half diamond and e470 wherever that uh, diverging diamond I'm not, I'm not sure which off ramp it is but uh, uh, it's failing too but probably not failing as badly as the diamond was um, but the answer is it's failing and they got to rethink it if it's is it, by chance if it's where it meets i70 that's a weird one where it should be a full freeway interchange but it's like you have a flyover for the through traffic but everybody else has to go through the old interchange I, anyway interstate 83 pennsylvania there's a ddi 
I feel that most DDIs on a bridge or above the interstate, they do DDIs both ways. Uh, if you go back and look at my DDI video, I have examples of both new construction and retrofits that go above and below. It's, uh, you can do it either way. Uh, let me get caught back up. That was four minutes ago. Um, let's see, sidewalks are safer and boost property value. Bikes are allowed on almost all roads and typically have priority. Sorry, them's the brakes. Um, but there's some always speeds on the highway. Max limit. It looks like you guys were discussing something. I think the key to Cloverleaf interchanges is the radius of the ramps. Uh, the big thing with the, the, the big challenge with the Cloverleafs is they have a weaving section. You have four of them. The car enters from the clover leaf, and then uh, there's another, well, I don't know, it's not a, the interchange is a clover leaf, so I guess you'd call that round ramp a three-quarter turn ramp. So you have a three-quarter turn ramp coming on the freeway immediately before one that goes off, and so you have a bad weaving section in between those two, and so that's why clover leafs kind of went away is because there's, what do you do about not just having one weaving section, you have four. <laughs> it's, uh, you're creating um, really bad disruption to the flow. And uh, yeah, let's see. Um, are you a licensed in professional engineer? No. Um, I, the goal of everything I'm sharing is something I've learned from a professional engineer. I'm, I'm pointing a camera at it. I have an EIT, for whatever that's worth, <laughs> but you know, EITs are tricky to get, but they're not, it's not like getting a PE. Um, but uh, my goal here is, uh, it, it's not, I've been a little more fast and loose tonight with my opinion, because we're just having fun hanging out. But with the videos, I. You notice I like document the heck out of those things. I try to put on-screen captions and uh, put show notes with links so that everything I'm saying, I can point to either a person I'm interviewing or some really good engineering manual or document somewhere to demonstrate, yes, this is uh, not just my opinion. This is what engineering best practice says we should do and uh, so hopefully that, that makes up for the fact that I'm just a schlub with a camera who uh, doesn't actually have a PE. But uh, let's see. Opinions on congestion pricing. Next. <laughs> congestion pricing is the idea that if you have... We'll get the in and out in the background. Oh, it's beautiful. Look at that. All right, um, the idea of congestion pricing is that uh, if you have something priced for free, you're more likely to overuse it. And a lot of stuff with cars, it's not that it's free per se, but you don't pay for it as you use it. You pay like, like a Netflix model, right? Well, that's a bad example because Netflix has gone downhill. But when Netflix was good, you want to watch Netflix a lot because you're paying $10 either way in the old days, seven, seven ninety nine, dollars And so whether you watched one show or binged it all month, it was seven ninety nine. dollars The freeway is the same way. You know, we, we have sales tax revenue and gas tax revenue that we're paying for anyway. The more I use the freeway, the, the better value I get for the tax money I, I paid in. And so the problem with that is you end up with this, where you have too many people trying to use something um, at the same time. And so that, that's the thought is like, well, if every single car had to pay some kind of toll every time they use the highway, you could start to control congestion because people really think twice about their commuting patterns and stuff. And they, you know, you kind of, it's to your advantage to, to overuse the freeway. So we overuse it to the point where people aren't really getting a benefit out of it because everybody's going so slow. When a freeway slows down, it, it, it's not like, oh, it still moves 2,700 cars an hour. It just does it slowly. It can get to the point where if it's a bad enough jam, it moves nothing. Like it's as bad as no freeway at all. 
because yes, there's a high volume of cars, but you multiply that by the flow rate, five miles an hour, and all of a sudden you only moved 1,000 cars instead of you know 2,400 or 2,700, whatever that theoretical maximum is. And so um, the idea of congestion pricing is saying, oh, okay, if we charge a, a little bit of a charge, we can actually get more cars moved through there because we can price out enough people that slow it down that you run just under theoretical maximum. Plus, you have revenue coming in from that that you can use on other transportation, like expanding a monorail or whatever. Um, the, the trouble with it, I think partly why it doesn't catch on, is again, we're captive in a suburban land use. And I just, I just know what's going to happen is you end up taking people who are already struggling with high rent prices and long commutes because they're just trying to survive and putting the brunt of the toll on them. And so now they have to consider like moving out of the region entirely because they can't get to work. Meanwhile, wealthier people, though, they'll just pay the toll. And yeah, that's great. Their money will go to pay for transit projects that eventually will help out everybody, including the people struggling. But those transit projects may take a couple decades to get built. So you have an entire generation of commuters who you're just kind of spitting on for being poor. So that's the question is how do, how do you um, make a congestion pr uh, pricing work while you're waiting for the city to change? Because, and so I think, I think the compromise has been uh, the toll lanes. I took my hat off because my head's hot. But anyway, uh, so forgive the, the lack of brand. <laughs> but um, but I, think, I think that's the challenge is what do you do? Well, maybe the answer is you do express lanes. So you say, okay, well, we won't toll all of them. We'll add like two more lanes in each direction just for the, the express lanes. They can move the 2,700 cars per lane. So that's another 5,000 cars an hour. And so you, what you're doing is allowing the rich people to buy their way out of the jam, but that pays for the construction of the new lanes. That makes the general purpose lane start to loosen up a little bit because there's fewer cars on that. Um, but on the other hand, you spent that money building the express lane, so it's not available for your transit project. So, okay, um, let's see. Uh, uh, does congestion pricing actually reduce emissions? I'd have to look at uh, the research on that. I, I don't know off the top of my head. I think that's the theory, right? Because if you have cars, car, uh, um, non-hybrid and non-electric cars, pollute the worst while they're idling and, and stop and go traffic like that. And cars burn incredibly clean uh, when they're cruising along, like, like you set it at a set rate and just cruise. They, the emissions are, other than carbon dioxide, the, actually the pollutant emissions are, are pretty good on a modern car. So I think that's the theory is, well, if we keep the cars moving, you have less pollution. I, I think that's true. Um, it doesn't take into account that, well, maybe somebody like me might drive farther, so at least my CO2 emissions are going to go up. But uh, um, definitely having a bunch of, having a billion dollar piece of infrastructure and having people just stopped in bumper to bumper traffic is bad. Like, uh, we all agree we want to fix that. It's just what is the fix? Is it more general purpose lanes? Is it express lanes? Is it tolling the whole thing? Like, and I, myself, as somebody who's spent my adult years, um, how does Dave Chappelle put it? I'm not poor, I'm broke. <laughs> because of the career choices I've made in journalism and radio and stuff, and this. Um, I'm very price sensitive, and I, I do drive a lot for this work, and also, you know, seeing family and things. And so, I, I, a major rollout of congestion pricing on, like, all the freeways would be devastating to me financially. The freeways are, a, they subsidize my ability to get work done, even if I have to wait in traffic. And so I hate to lose that subsidy because it damages my ability to get work done. But I'll understand you don't want a multi-billion dollar piece of infrastructure that's just crawling along at five miles an hour. So it's complicated. I don't know if there's a good answer to it. You should totally make videos more frequently like you used to. I miss watching your new videos on a regular basis. So here's the challenge. Uh, this from a, a second autistic actually speaking is the username there. So here's the, here's the challenge of what happens is I it used to be like the bot stops video. I went out, I read like 
two news stories, I did no research of my own, and then just went and like shot the video in an afternoon and edited it and it came out really quickly. And what's happened as time has gone on is YouTube was so full of content where somebody just skimmed Wikipedia at best and then just kind of like put something together with like stock imagery and just really, um, you know, put, put it out quickly. And I could do that, but I kind of enjoy the privilege you give me with, with Patreon money and Super Chat money to do something a little bit better, to actually try to call people in the industry and find out about stuff, to go to Google Scholar, dig in. Like right now I'm going through a big document on, oh gosh, uh, <laughs> oh, one of them is the for the Portland Bridge area. I'm going through the environmental impact statement of the Columbia River Bridge. There's a lot of interesting stuff in there I didn't know. I want to try to talk to people who were involved in that project, which is hard because that project doesn't exist anymore and those people have moved on. I don't even, there's no website to look up who they were. But by taking the time to slow down and actually get footage from Portland like I did last summer, do the research and do it, I end up with a product that maybe takes a little longer to get to you, but when it's done, it's like 12 minutes long and actually has some meat to it. And then that thing can sit on YouTube forever. So it, it's a trade-off. So that's why the, the, the trade-off I'm trying to make is a couple things. One is trying to do live streams more often. And, and somebody commented on YouTube, fair point, oh, you're just doing the live streams because you want the super chat money. Well, it's neat, but by the time I pay the gas and everything and YouTube takes their cut, um, it's, it's a break-even experience. I do this because there's something really cool I want to show you. And I know if I tried to make a video out of this, you'd see it by October. Just with my production pipeline and the other videos that I'm already working on, it, it just takes that amount of time for one person filming and researching and doing all, all the editing and animating and you know script writing. It just takes some time. You know, even working on it, you know, sometimes 10 hours a day, you know? And so the um, trade-off is by doing this, at least you get something a little more often. Um, I'm open to ideas of things I could do that are shorter content. I'm playing with shorts a little bit, um, where I'm, I'm taking my old videos and chopping them up into shorts. That's probably less useful to you um, because you've already seen the video, but for people who might not have experienced it, it, it gets more people you know, exposure to, to content. Uh, but also, um, if you wanted to share a certain clip, like I clipped out the from the old uh, how to slow down speeders in your neighborhood video from 2018, that, that street in Springville, Utah, that was like 85 feet wide. And I took the old brown Lexus and I was doing loop-de-loops and it only took half the street. I clipped that as a short. So you can go to my YouTube page under shorts and as those start populating, I'll try to, I'll try to post one of those every couple days and chop up old videos because that I can chop up a short pretty fast and usually about under an hour uh, for each one. Uh, that gives you something you could share if you're ever like, oh yeah, there was this really funny thing and then you don't have to dive through a 15 minute video to find it, so. Um, okay, let's jump ahead here a little bit. I have to disagree with you a little. EVs do better in stop and go traffic. That's true. Yeah, gasoline powered cars, once we're driving hybrids and EVs, stop and go is irrelevant. You're absolutely correct. That's uh, Jennifer Montgomery. Uh, favorite type of intersection? Uh, I, I honestly just like a conventional, normal intersection because they're just very straightforward and you could do single progression. I've got a soft spot for a single lane roundabout or, or maybe a really simple multi-lane one because uh, roundabouts are kind of neat. There's one um, kind of near, near Shafter, California or something, but it, it's kind of up near Button Willow Racetrack. And I, I was out for a drive in the middle of the night one night because I was stressed and dealing with stuff. And so I went for a drive. And uh, you're cruising along this country highway, 65, and you slow down and you go through the roundabout and then just pick up and keep going. I didn't even like register that I had to slow down. It was just so well engineered and you just scooch through it. I think it was Highway 58 and 43 for anybody wanting to look it up. And so in, in the proper context, the roundabout's really fun. Um, but you know, like here in Vegas, it's kind of fun. You get on these suburban arterials and just start blasting down the road at 
the speed limit, like 45, and you hit those progressive greens, and you just feel there's something really satisfying about like, yeah, I hit the green at this big, you know, at Rainbow and Tropicana or whatever, I hit the green and you just keep going. And it's like all the other cars are lined up at the red. It's like, like crossing a finish line or something. And it's like all the other cars are cheering you on. Like, I, I don't know. I, you know, I, I, it would be fun to say that it would be like a CFI or some, some weird intersection like that. But honestly, the CFIs are like as a pedestrian, I hate crossing them, you know, so. Um, Five dollars from Laser Fur. I, uh, thank you very much, Laser Fur. I heard about plans to add a four-lane roundabout on a four-lane 60 mile per hour highway, not an overpass, just a roundabout on a busy highway. My grandparents, back in the 90s, decided they were going to do the Christian missionary type thing for, for their church. And so they went to uh, the country of Ghana. And they got stuck for like a whole day at, it wasn't a roundabout, it was a traffic circle where two major highways and a craw came together. And it, it was like the Arc de Triomphe roundabout, but like chaos. You know, cops waving people on and stuff. And it was like you would get in that thing and then like you couldn't get back out. And my grandpa was saying like it, it took, you know, 10, 20 minutes like to get around it. And he's trying to get out. And the cops saying, nope, you can't. Keep it going. Keep it going. And I worry a four lane roundabout sure sounds like it's headed in the direction of that Accra traffic circle. Like it just sounds miserable. I just, I, I, I don't, I can't in good conscience recommend that. <laughs> but, you know, I, like Mesquite, Nevada, down the road here a ways, they, they have a freeway exit, if you're following along on Google Maps, it would be the western I-15 exit to Mesquite Boulevard on Interstate 15. And it used to be a diamond interchange that kind of came off and the Mesquite Boulevard kind of parallels like a frontage road sort of and becomes the main street through town. A developer came in and added a, a, like a driveway connection right where that road curves coming off that diamond interchange. So you'd have a, a stoplight really close to the, the interchange, and, and that just wasn't a good design. Just like here, where you wouldn't want Dean Martin Drive connecting right here, it's the same thing in Mesquite, even though it's a smaller town. So rather than swinging it way out of the way, they put in a roundabout right there where the, the ramp drops off. And it has, so it has like five legs kind of. It's got the two for Mesquite Boulevard, the one coming off to get on the freeway, the one coming on to, for the off-ramp, and then the, the road coming in for the businesses that were going in. And to make it work better, it acts kind of like a dumbbell where there's another roundabout on the opposite side of the freeway overpass, and then you have like this multi-lane configuration that has places that spin off for ramps, and then the two lanes go under the bridge, and there's the other one, and it, it, it works pretty well. But I have never successfully, even though I've taken a whole bunch of transportation classes and this is like my wheelhouse, I have never successfully gotten through that roundabout without having to like quickly like dart across a lane with no signal because I thought I was where I was supposed to be and I wasn't. And so I think what happens is I, I, I think I'm in the correct lane and then I come around the roundabout, but then the ramp is there and it turns out the, the right lane that I thought was gonna peel off for Mesquite Boulevard, and then my lane would be the one that would go on the freeway. Well, it turns out it didn't peel off for Mesquite Boulevard. That right turn was referenced to the freeway, not to Mesquite Boulevard. So now I'm in the wrong lane. So I have to just at the last second dart across traffic to, to get it. So I don't really like multi-lane roundabouts, and that's just a two-laner. And uh, it's not that NDOT did a bad job or anything. I think they is probably designed reasonably well. I just I just don't like it because it makes me look bad as a driver. <laughs> Single lane roundabouts though, never had a problem. They're fantastic. So anyway, that's, that's my thought. But yeah, four lane one, that is, what a mess. I, no thanks. Um, shorts would be great. Okay, Jennifer, yeah, I'll add more shorts. Madeline Fisher with $5. Thank you, Madeline. You write, your Lexus review uh, could be a whole bunch of shorts. Should I, I, I wondered about this because I, I I started the channel, I didn't know what it was. I had just quit my radio job and I 
was waiting for an offer with this, the California Department of Transportation, and then because of some family reasons, it didn't work out. And, so, and then pandemic, I really took off making this stuff. But, um, but early on in my, my channel days, it was kind of like 25% car reviews, you know, because I enjoyed talking about cars. Now, everybody on YouTube does car reviews. So I kind of steered away from that because um, everybody does car reviews and it's fun to do to talk about something that's everywhere. Roads are ubiquitous. Transportation, we use it every single day. And like there just isn't that much discussion about it other than the urban planning community and the bicycle advocates who say like, oh, well, this is all evil. I'm saying, well, it's not evil. It's got some bugs we can work on, you know. But it's fun to talk about. And I don't, and I kind of also feel that with patrons, you know, maybe you contributing a few bucks each month to, to help me go out and research transportation, I shouldn't be wasting your money and time reviewing cars. So I actually, I, I drive a Honda Fit, and I've been wanting to do a Honda Fit review forever. I even interviewed a guy who, um, it's put like 600,000 miles or something on the fit he drives and man meant to put that together as a video i meant to put that together as a video when my car hit 250,000 miles itself and now i'm at 305 you know so and and partly that's just because i just haven't felt right when i'm so far i, I have such a workload to bring you stuff on topic I'm, I'm a little hesitant to to go off topic but you know maybe someday if i get caught up or ahead a little bit i might throw another car review or two at you. But I guess that's the question. With that context, should I chop up the car reviews as shorts? I mean, it's not a big deal because it's a short. I just don't know how off topic that's that'd be getting. Uh, scooch down a little bit. Eric Duvall's student leadership reports for the TESC. That sounds like a uh, work account. That or you've got a very creative backstory for your uh, uh, sorry, but very generous, $20. Thank you, Eric Duvall, Student Leadership Reports for the TESC. Eric Duvall, Student Leadership Reports for the TESC writes, you should totally do a collab with a YouTuber, CGP Gray. That name sounds really familiar, and I don't remember who CEG Gray I think, is my battery dying? I'm down to 9%. Okay, so hopefully uh, we'll see how long this lasts. If I suddenly go away, it's not my fault. It's the fact that this battery, this phone was at 100% three and a half hours ago. <laughs> but we're having fun. Um, I'll look up CGP Gray. I'm not, I'm not real familiar with who that is. A lot of times the other YouTubers are very large and I was typically small. But now that you guys have helped me get that credibility of that, you know, 100,000, and I have a little check mark, maybe people will want to work with me more. So. Um, dumbbell roundabouts are fun. Yeah, oh, that's... CG, CGP Gray is one of the early edutainment YouTubers. Okay, uh, I'll, I'll look them up. That'd be cool. Uh, bring a power, a power pack next time. Uh, spend that on Patreon. I have, okay, so here's the challenge. I actually have back at home a power pack. It's a, it's a really big one. But I didn't know until like 10 minutes before this started where I was even going to park. I really wanted to be here on this deck. And thankfully, the, the hotel was really nice, and I told them I'd be two hours, so hopefully they're not mad that it's been three and a half, or almost four for them. But, I, but because I knew we were doing so much walking, I didn't bring the power pack. So maybe what I'd do is I'll buy one of the smaller ones, although, I mean, it's also been three and a half hours. <laughs> people were complaining last time. They're like, your live stream went too long. And I'm like, yeah, but people were still tuned in, so I guess we're having fun, like, you know. I mean, it, it's not like I, I, I'm locking your computer on and you can't, you know. Let's see. Uh, Jake Thompson with the message re retracted. Okay. Wickenburg, Arizona has a couple of confusing multi-lane roundabouts on Highway 93. Always get turned around there. Yes. So Highway 90, Interstate 11, which I talked about in my video, ultimately dumps into Highway 93 as it heads towards Phoenix. And a lot of it is set up really nice. It's almost like an interstate, but no off ramps and bridges yet, no grade separation. But as you get toward Wickenburg, they want to slow you down because they know doofuses like me are going to just blow 65 right through their town. So appropriately, they run you through a series of roundabouts to transition you to driving slowly. It's brilliant. 
eventually Interstate 11 will just bypass Wickenburg entirely and cruise off to the west, and so it'll be a good thing. But yeah, I think I remember when I drove to Phoenix, uh, those uh, roundabouts were, were wild. Uh, Mirza Ahmed, $2. Thank you very much, Mirza. I appreciate it. Uh, maybe you should, t uh, Adam Busser, maybe you should talk about, or Besser, sorry, I'm pronouncing your name wrong. Maybe you should talk about parking and how it is ruining cities. Well, parking, if you want a suburban town, parking is great. If you want the ability to walk somewhere, parking spreads everything out where you, nobody can walk every, anywhere because you have to walk past parking lots between businesses and so that makes it a longer walk. And then by making a longer walk, you don't walk, which means then you drive, which means you need the parking lot. So it's like a self-reinforcing cycle. But yeah, I do think we probably have parking lots that are bigger than we need. We could at least right-size the parking lots down to be a little bit tighter. Yeah, that's a, there's a great book called The High Cost of Free Parking by a UCLA professor. And although I don't agree with everything he says in it, because he gets pretty militant about it, he does a good job of bringing up the fact that uh, we probably oversupply parking. Um, okay, a couple comments here. Try and get your Honda fit on Jay Leno's garage. I would love to meet Jay Leno. That would be an amazing thing. I, you know, Hoovy from Hoovy's garage got on Jay's garage. So, you know, only like 5 million more subscribers to go. <laughs> um, let's see. Your streams cannot be too long. Oh, well, thank you. That's from Jovette. Um, I'm just trying to... Mike, $10. Thank you very much, Mike. I appreciate it. Uh, split your car reviews onto another channel. Maybe that's the right option. I just It's more a time issue. I just, I'm putting everything I've got into doing what I, what I do. Like that chicken video, that one that just came out two weeks ago, took forever. But thankfully my friend helped me with, he's the one who, at times you notice the chicken was dancing. Uh, I'm not a dancer, so I had help. Uh, countdown to the percentage left, I am now at 6%, so it's going to cut off any minute now. Uh, 499, Finchy Blue Eyes. Hey, Rob, have you checked out the Fort Pitt Bridge in Pittsburgh? No, I haven't, uh, but I will put that on my pin board. Interstate 376 West has some insane multi-lane section on the something deck of the bridge, and it's covered up. Lower deck of the bridge. Okay, I'll check that out. I mean, that's what's so amazing is I've had people ask, like, Rob, are you running out of topics for videos? And I go, I have 10 years of topics for videos. <laughs> I'm running out of time to make them. That's the problem. I, if I can produce, you know, about one a month, I'm really, like, hustling, you know. And so that's the fun of these live streams. At least it gives a, an ability to check in more more often. I don't know if it'll be monthly or not. Uh, if you guys want, I might be able to do it monthly, but... Uh, uh, but, uh, you know, a chance to show off more stuff, you know. Wish your videos didn't take so long. Love your stuff so nerdy, Rob. That's from Marjolin. Love your work. Oh, man, that's great. Uh, it's coming. It's, ah, don't slow down. I can't read it. Sorry about that. My chat was glitching and deleted my comment. No problem, Jake. Uh, Jack Feldman, have you heard about the North Split Project in Indy? The I-15, the whole freeway. Okay, I'll check it out. Is that... I? Uh, so they're separating it off um, so as a collector distributor off to the side because that that's that'd be kind of neat I, I know toronto famously did that with the 401 um which is why you get those crazy pictures of like the widest freeway widest non-texas freeway in north america we're at five percent um rob's news teams yeah I, I need to i wish i had the resources that i could like send a photographer out like okay could you go get footage of that could you call and book an interview with this person could you <laughs> um hey before your phone dies good night that's from i allen well, well good night to you and happy saint patrick's day um shrgn hey did you think about maybe videos of highways outside the u.s yes i've never left the u.s though i have a passport i just like i say i got 50 states to work with i have never left the u.s in my life other than one time the airplane flew over Ontario, Canada, but you know, it's getting a connection in Detroit. But other than that, I've, I've never touched the ground outside of the United States yet. Um, oh, uh, Jack Feldman, no, they rebuilt the whole freeway is what I mean. Okay, well, still, I'll check that out. 
uh, come visit Montreal Potholes. Oh, we had a guest speaker rising graduate school came and spoke to us about a bridge project they were doing in Montreal and the rust. Oh my gosh, <laughs> Montreal. Uh, can transit demand keep up with car demand? Um, I would love to see transit be free. If people overuse cars because it's uh, the freeway's free, why don't we make transit free and give it a shot and see what happens? Alex Hine, could you do a video about frontage roads and how and where they came to be? Um, yeah, I can. It would be fun to do it with the Texas ones. In particular, Texas, they're required by the state constitution to provide um, access to the land that's next to the highway. So they had to put the frontage roads in because they didn't want to be connecting driveways to the freeway itself. Uh, five minutes left, Bill, Bill Burr. That was one of the best insult compliments I ever got. Somebody called me a budget Bill Burr. Uh, Hello, Colby. I wish I could help you with your videos. Well, your moral support alone is enough. Because otherwise, you would be like the old days where I'd be talking about roads to uh, myself or my poor dad. Um, Jennifer Montgomery, $5. Thanks again, Jennifer. Not Just Bikes would be a great creator to collaborate with. He talks a lot about city streets and city planning in the Netherlands versus Canada. The trouble is, I think I got him mad at me. Sort of. So we'll find out. Um, Nick Muffins, $10, possible future collab with B1M. B1M's videos are amazing. How does he afford to do such amazing videos? I'd love to. I feel like Fred shares your enthusiasm for construction. Good night, Rob. Tacos! <laughs> uh, Montreal Potholes, Collabs, Motor Coach World, not just bikes, hates car infrastructure unconditionally. Uh, sorry, I'm going so fast with the battery's about to die. VP2. BPR2B999, thank you very much. And I like that reel-to-reel -reel, uh, icon there. Thanks for the awesome stream. You are welcome. I once uh, saved a Studer reel-to-reel -reel machine one time, but that's another story for another time. David McDonald with $2 Australian. Oh, thank you, mate. Uh, thanks for your time today. It's been great. Well, have a, enjoy your Saturday. Uh, Analysis 101, $10. Thank you so much. Uh, writes, I, I, uh, I like that you focus a lot on the transportation of the Western U.S. Seems like a lot of transportation YouTubers focus on the East Coast a lot and like your videos. Well, it's, I focus on the West because it's where I live. And, uh, you know, I, I also want to focus on the heartland of the country because there's a lot of neat research in places like Nebraska that uh, kind of get overlooked because uh, a lot of the media is very focused on the coast because that's where people live. Okay, I think I've caught up with the super chats. We've got uh, how many percentages left? 3%. Let's keep it going. <laughs> uh, Nebraska here, Joe Vett. Battery check, 3%. Uh, if you're curious, Jack. Probably more focusing on the East since more people are there. It's true. Uh, the, I, I don't understand why so many people live back East. The weather's nicer out here. <laughs> but it used to be, you know, 50 years ago. People moved out west because it was affordable. And I'll tell you what, I now have a sister who moved to Arkansas because it was cheaper. I have a cousin who moved to Connecticut because it was cheaper. <laughs> so I'm certainly, uh, uh, my friend uh, Danny who moved to rural, outside of Roanoke, Virginia because it was cheaper. Um, friends who moved to Florida, uh, not necessarily cheaper though. Um, so it is kind of a, a moment where after Two centuries, everybody's saying westward ho. Now people are turning around being like, eastward ho. <laughs> um, yikes. Uh, it collapses. I enjoyed your vids. Uh, very produced. Vids are amazing. Thank you very much. It harms your battery to deep charge it below uh, 40%. I know, I'm killing my phone, but it's for a good cause. A video on traffic uh, management displays would be impressive if you could talk to the manufacturer. Yeah. And remind, thanks for the reminder. I'll go before I leave tonight, see if I can get a name off of one of them. That won't, I won't be filming it on this trip because I got to do research first. But love your Phoenix video, says Ravi. Well, thank you. I, I, I love that one. I mean, Detour Dan was so great. I, I wrote to KTAR. I just said, hey, by chance, would Detour Dan want to talk to me about the history of Phoenix freeways? And I didn't hear back for like a week. And then the program director wrote back and she said, absolutely, I'll have him call you. And he was great. I mean, he just, He's, he's just, he's got such a great voice, you know, Detour Dan, KTAR traffic, you know, just, but he's, doesn't call it downtown Phoenix, he calls it the downtown. Yeah, because everybody's trying to head to the downtown, you know. 
I live in Pennsylvania. No hurricanes, mudslides, tornadoes, wildfires, or earthquakes. Only blizzards once in a while. My sister, when she was looking at places, considered western Pennsylvania because of the trees and stuff and uh, railroad derailments. No, I'm sorry. Um, but she, she ended up picking northwest Arkansas and really likes it. Uh, Ryan Berry, I just want to say I love your videos. My girlfriend had to endure me passing along your knowledge about traffic lights the other day when I saw them making changes. Yay! <laughs> In your opinion, what's your favorite video you made so far? Oh gosh, I really liked that last one with the chicken and the uh, jay jaywalking chicken, and that was my friend's idea. He said, "What well, the?" He says, uh, "I could dress up as a cop and and give the chicken a jaywalking ticket." And then we got thinking, like, we could have the chicken keep getting jaywalking tickets. That was a hoot. Uh, next live stream, make sure you bring a power bank. We'll do, although three hours, 40 minutes, that's pretty good for a, for this little phone. Uh, Rob, thanks for the field trip. Detour Dan's a legend. I don't even live in Phoenix and I love that video. The signs are made by Dactronics. Okay, thank you. The same people who when I used to swim made the swim boards, Dactronics. Uh, battery check, uh, I don't even wanna know, 2%. Uh, how are we looking at battery, 2%? I am very late, I assume for this reason, the titles because of the F1 race. No, believe it or not, we made it through nearly four hours and didn't talk once about the fact that Formula One is coming to uh, Las Vegas and they're gonna use it as a racetrack. It shows just how pedestrian friendly it is. But I tell you, having all those sky bridges uh, to cross Las Vegas Boulevard is gonna be pretty nice that day. Um, what phone model do I use? Samsung A52, because I rely on headphone jack. I, don't, I, I buy the S22, but I got to have a headphone jack. They won't give me a headphone jack. I buy the mid-range phone. Thank you again from Aaron of Minneapolis. You're welcome. Thank you, Aaron. Chicken had some moves, and they weren't mine. Uh, buy now, says uh, Mr. DeCarby. Well, bye to you, and thanks for hanging out. Uh, we're killing our host here. That's ah, okay. I sleep when I'm dead. Uh, stop in New Jersey. People don't know how to drive, and like you said, they're expanding for more people in the east. Oh, cool. That's very interesting. F1. Okay, I think I'm caught up. Oh, one more. <laughs> That's from Arizona. Samsung A32 here, partly for the same reason. Yeah, I love these mid-range phones. They're cheap workhorses, good battery life, and if, if, if I drop it in somewhere, I'm not going to cry. Uh, Prime my headphone jack with my cold dead hand. Fix our cities, uh, says Adam. Um, we fix cities one step at a time. Incremental improvement. It's not a revolution, it's an evolution. One, one ten foot sidewalk at a time. We make it, make it better. I'm an Apple user, but I respect people who get Android products. That's fine. It's not religion. It's not like the Church of Apple and the Church of Android. They're just gadgets. They're just toys. Like, <laughs> uh, here before the battery dies, uh, that's the uh, DRO page. Moto G60 is cheaper and just as good. Well, now that Samsung doesn't...